morning. Under the stars. The time is now 9.40, and I just got a look from board member Ramos Montini, so I'm going to get this going. <laughs> <laughs> Arm of the board is present, and the State Board of Ed meeting of February 10th is called to order. And the first item is the approval of agenda and order of priority. I have a motion, please. So moved. In favor, supported by John. Any discussion or changes? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Mertz. Good morning. Welcome to the State Board of Education meeting. I'd like to introduce the people at the table. To my left is Mike Flanagan. He's chairman of the board and he's the state superintendent. And as we go around the table, John Austin is the president of the board. He's from Ann Arbor. Cassandra Albrich is the board's vice president from Rochester Hills. The board's secretary is Michelle Fecto from Detroit. And board member Richard Ziley is from Dearborn. Michigan Teacher of the Year, Melody Arabu, third grade teacher from Keith Elementary in the Wild Lake Consolidated School District. Um, as we go across the table, um, the governor's representative is not here today. They're in the process of um, sending us someone, which hopefully will be next month, maybe. And then Eileen Weiser, although her chair is vacant, she is listening. She's on the telephone. And then Kathleen Strauss, board member from Detroit. Lupe Ramos Montini, she's the NASB delegate. She's from Grand Rapids. NASB is the National Association of State Boards of Education. And then next to me is Pamela Pugh-Smith. She is the board's treasurer, and she's from Saginaw. Thank you. And members of the audience, maybe start with Dave from the MEA, since I'm catching him, you know, talking in the back of the room over here. So, Dave, would you introduce yourself, and we'll go around the room, and uh, our guests are here today, and we appreciate your attendance. David Michelson with Michigan Education Association. Tom Green with Michigan Education Association. Rogelio Landine, Performance Aid. Don Wachuba with Michigan Association of School Boards. Judy Pritchett, McComb Intermediate School District. Howard Barron, Bloomfield Hill School Board Trustee. Hi, I'm Paul Stimmer. I'm with the Assessment Office here at the Department. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Naeko Sato. She is from the Japanese Ministry of Education, and she is an, a graduate student intern at the University of Michigan, and she's interning with us in the assessment program. Great. Welcome. Go blue. Chris? Oh, Chris Claver, McCown Living Service. We're not letting you off the hook, Chris. You... <laughs> Sorry, multitasking. <laughs> Jacob Kanzler, reporter with MERS News. Hi, I'm Lauren Childs. I'm with Learning Forward, Michigan. Andy Milosa, I'm the director of the Office of Standards and Assessment. Abby Grafwezak, uh, Special Assistant. Vanessa Kessler, Deputy Speaker. Natasha Baker, Deputy Superintendent. Susan Brown, Deputy Superintendent. Kyle Grant, Deputy Superintendent. Allison Henry, Special Assistant Superintendent. Marty Agley, Director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs here at the Department of Ed. And Don Wachuba, for those who don't know, is, is Executive Director-elect, I guess, or designee who will we'll replace, uh, if you can replace Kathy Hayes, that'll be a tough job. But, uh, excellent choice. I mean, Kathy's done a sensational job, and I think Don's a really good choice to succeed her. And that's going to be in a August or so, if I remember. So congratulations, Don. Appreciate your being here. Um, I want to start by those of you who don't know this, our own Kathleen Strauss was honored last week by Women in Leadership in the Workplace mm -hmm. and was cited for her diligence and forthrightness on matters of education and civil rights in the state and her tireless dedication as an advocate for the people of Michigan. So let's congratulate Kathleen Strauss. And another one is uh, our own Teacher of the Year, Mel Melody, was named one of the three finalists for the top spot of Oakland County's Elite 40 Under 40. Congratulations, Melody. She won it. She won it. Oh, you won it. the top spot? Yes. yes she you won did. Well, oh! <laughs> you're a day behind, then. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, Congratulations to Grand Valley State University. They're celebrating their 50th anniversary as a school of ed, and I'm going to speak to them tonight as a, a keynote speaker, so I'm looking forward to that. I also would just say congratulations to my granddaughter. We had them for the weekend, and I thought for kindergarten to write a book for Grandpa, Aww. and on that, ducks for sale, <laughs> D-U-C-X, ducks, for F-O-R, sale, S-A-L-L. -L. So 
I guess stuff starts to happen, you know, kind of a surprise to me. Um, and I just, my wife reminded me of this this morning. She said, you know, you only have five board meetings left. And we did a quick addition in my head. Oh, wow. As superintendent in three different places, I went over 400 board meetings last meeting. Poor man. 400. <laughs> yeah. Most of those in Farmington. You know, a local district has a lot more of these. And you pretty much average one a week between study sessions and public uh, town halls and stuff like that. So 405 to go. So our first item today uh, is a committee of the whole, and it's a presentation on testing. We talked about this briefly at the end of our meeting last month. I think, well, let me just set the stage uh, while Vanessa comes to the table. Deputy Superintendent Kiesler is going to do a pretty brief presentation on testing. I could see from one of the public presentations last week, these are really good people in the field, to say the least. And I guess I wanted to just say we're as distressed as they are on the number of hours of testing. Um, but we wanted to kind of fairly crisply give you a sense of the box that we're in on that. And it's almost, if I could put this pretty, I guess, direct to the point, it's which law don't we follow and how this will remedy itself next year to some degree. But we wanted to point this out, and I mentioned this to Ed Alliance yesterday and said, you know, please tune in at the beginning of the meeting. So I hope you folks are doing that because I think it would be helpful if they can understand this and help members understand the box that we're all in, especially on hours of testing. It is oppressive, but it is what it is for this year, and I think we'll see from Vanessa's presentation how it will be better next year. So, yes, ma'am. Good morning, and thank you for having me this morning. I know it's uh, an exciting way to kick off the board meeting with a presentation on testing, right? Um, I am Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent of Accountability Services. I think you all know me, but just in case you do not. And we'll, we're going to talk, like Mike said, briefly today about what's happening this spring, uh, <coughs> spring 2015. Um, so as you all know, we are transitioning to our new MSTEP assessment this spring. And our goal in the department, our goal, I think, statewide, and we've been spending a lot of time talking with our stakeholders with people out in the field um, about this, is to transition with as positive an experience as possible. We want to get most of our schools testing online um, and because that does provide an opportunity for more rapid feedback. But also that move to online testing allows us to build the technology infrastructure. We've talked about it at this table with the support of, of all of you and uh, the governor and legislature superintendent. Everybody has worked really hard in the state to build the technology infrastructure, not only not to test, per se, but to have that those kind of exciting blended learning, technology-enhanced uh, learning opportunities for students. Uh, so we want to get most of our schools testing online. Uh, it is a, we are very excited that we have 80% of our districts signed up to test online. That's a major accomplishment on the behalf of Michigan's districts and ISDs. Um, to get ready to, to do that. And for the 20% that aren't, we also appreciate their thought and their consideration, their assessment of where they're at and their ability to do this. So we want to get kids testing online, using the test, uh, and we want to accomplish that move from fall testing to spring testing, which is another big thing to do this year. Just quickly so you understand what, what's happening in the spring 2015, what will we test? There's kind of, you can see up there, there's essentially six things. The first three are part of the MSTEP high school assessment, um, as well as the MSTEP assessment in other grades. So we'll test ELA in grades three through eight and at 11. We'll test math in grades three through eight and 11. Science, we'll test in grades four, seven, and 11. Uh, remember that under No Child Left Behind, we're required to test science and social studies once per grade level. Um, so that's an original NCLB testing requirement. So social studies grades 5, 8, and 11. And then this was what Mike was alluding to. Our Michigan law uh, does require us to give a college entrance test. And so this year that's ACT in grade 11. And Michigan law also requires us to give our work skills assessment, uh, which is work keys in grade 11. And if you want to see our testing schedule, we have the link there. You can take a look at that. Wanted to talk briefly, we will talk much more about this during the ESEA Flex uh, presentation, so just we'll hit it here and then uh, kind of move on to, to the next part. But um, it's our intent, it's the intent of the department to not use the 2015 MSTEP assessment to make high-stakes accountability determinations. 
Um, so we'd like to provide this data back to schools and districts for information to drive instruction to help them do their school improvement, district improvement planning. But it is our intention to, to um, not produce priority focus or reward labels for schools or other types of designations, given that this is the first year. Um, we don't have that two years of stable data, uh, two years of data from a stable assessment yet. Again, we will get into this more through FLEX, so I'll just mention it here. The point of this presentation is to talk a little bit about testing time. So at the high school in particular, we, I think is where the testing time crunch has been felt. Um, one piece to remember about testing time is that a reason for increased testing time is if you want to move beyond multiple choice, right? So criticism of MEEP has always been, it's just multiple choice, it's just multiple choice, or it, it wasn't, it had some other things, but what can you really know about what a student can do through multiple choice tests? Well, the answer is something, you can know some knowledge, but if you want to see how students are engaging, how they're thinking, how they're doing those higher order thinking skills that are so important, you need constructive response, you need other experiences. So it's one of those um, tensions that we have to wrestle with in the assessment world of an assessment that more authentically <coughs> assesses student learning also takes longer. <coughs> So what, where, where is our, uh, our sweet spot in that? To, Mike, uh, to Mike's point about um, testing time not being burdensome, we need to get to that, but we also need to have a, a good dialogue about what do we want the test to be able to tell us about student learning and, and where do we find that, <coughs> that balance. At the high school level, students are taking three types of assessments, which I kind of already hit on. Our college entrance exam, which is the ACT required by law, work keys, and MSTEP. Our legislation requires three things. An assessment that measures our state standards as adopted by the State Board of Education, all of you, uh, a college entrance examination, and a work skills assessment. This is the point that, um, that is kind of the one that we need to bring up in terms of testing time this year. Our legislation does require, this is newer legislation, that we have a test to measure our state standards. Uh, ACT, this year's work, or college entrance exam, does not measure Michigan's state standards. Um, ACT is built to measure ACT's college readiness standards. If you go on their website and you look, they say we have our college readiness standards and here's what they are, and they built their tests to measure those. Um, they're different than our standards. So, and there's insufficient alignment between the two for us to say that ACT by itself can measure our, our legislative requirements, our standards. Uh, so in order to assess our standards, the standards that um, you all adopted on behalf of Michigan students for the state, we need that M-STEP assessment, which assesses those standards. We did take some steps this year to reduce <coughs> testing time. Um, oh, yes. Pardon my interruption. Is ACT a criterion reference test, or is it a standardized test um, measuring students against one another? My understanding has always been that ACT has been a uh, standardized test. So there's uh, kind of two points there. Um, even norm referenced or standardized test, either one of uh, norm referenced or criterion reference, both of them measure some set of standards. So ACT has their set of what students should know and be able to do to be college ready. Those are their standards. In terms of how they score, they are, well, I'm looking at Andy, I, I think they are a norm reference test, correct? Yes. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I was not expecting that question, Dr. Okay. Seidley. Thank you. Okay. Um, but regardless, the, there's still standards that undergird that. It's how the score is reported out as kind of um, how you perform relative other students versus just relative to standards. But what creates the content comes from some set of standards. Well, and part, part of what I'm thinking is that in a norm reference test, you need a question uh, on, a, on a matter that might not be taught in anybody's curriculum, but you need that question to separate out the 98th percentile students from the 97th percentile students. And so a norm reference test will necessarily uh, include things that aren't necessarily taught in any curriculum or included in any standards. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue that I, has implications, I, uh, I think, that we'll have to struggle with in some ways. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point. Um, and it is, I would phrase it less in the norm reference uh, uh, framework, but more in the, when it's a test, built to measure standards that aren't our standards, we can't be sure that Michigan students have been taught those things. Yes. Our standards create the framework, not the curriculum, but the framework for what we expect Michigan students to know and be able to do. That's what's fair to assess Michigan students on, mm. not something else that they may not have learned because that's not what Michigan teachers and districts and schools are set up to teach. 
we did take um, a couple steps to reduce testing time this year because, again, as the superintendent said, this is something we take very seriously at the department. We're concerned about um, we have made the performance tasks at the high school level optional. Um, so these are these this is part of that new depth, uh, greater depth in the assessment thing that actually has a lot of potential, but they do increase testing time. Um, where the students, or the, there's a classroom activity and then students do some writing and some work around that. Those are the performance tasks. We did make them optional for the high school this year. Uh, that has the impact, if for those schools that choose to utilize that option, has the impact of reducing testing time from 16 hours to 11 hours. Um, it is very much a local decision. We have communicated this in, in many ways in the last couple weeks. Uh, really encourage schools and districts to take a look at their time, how it fits in with their other schedules, but also the opportunity to try something when it's optional, right? Sometimes that's something we don't do well in high stakes accountability and assessment is give people a chance to try it before it's for the big purpose. This is a year to really, to really, to really pilot these things for high schools. Uh, and then in future years, the superintendent alluded to this as well, uh, we, as you all know, we, have, we will be transitioning to the SAT as our college entrance exam next year the result of the bid that was just awarded through the competitive bid process. Um, and we have plans to collaborate with College Board to review alignment between our standards and investigate if the SAT can be used for a greater portion of our 11th grade assessment in 2015-16. Based on initial conversations, we're hopeful about that. But again, since the bid was just rewarded, awarded and the um, appeal was just concluded, we haven't had a chance yet to sit with the company and we couldn't engage with them until we're through the contract process entirely and all the uh, appeals processes. So uh, we look forward to collaborating with them and looking for ways to reduce testing time. Um, we, we do have reason to believe, based on that in other states, that mm -hmm. it more closely aligns to what our state standards are right. because you know, but that's something to be verified in. Right. And the extent to which and how much, you know, how much we would need to cover outside of that. And that you have to do through a pretty careful study of alignment documents and things like that. But we are very hopeful that, that we can um, find an option there that reduces testing time. If I may, I'm, I'm, the I'm other thing actually. is remember <laughs> that we, we, I think one of the proudest things that the state board should own is getting us to a point as a state where we have a free college entrance exam for our kids. There are a lot of poor <laughs> kids that would never have thought about taking this. There are other middle class kids that wouldn't have thought about taking this test and then suddenly they find out, oh my gosh, I'm actually doing okay and I, in some cases colleges recruit from that. They sent letters of inviting applications. So I mean it's a very gigantic policy change and it's another part of the tension. You know, in one sense it adds time because of the non-alignment but it's what could be better. So the ideal world will be as these things merge into uh, uh, the alignment it reduces the time, it still has the benefit. And then just an aside, Vanessa probably would have gotten to this anyway, but who knows what happens with No Child Left Behind between now and next year and some of the requirements related to that under reauthorization and possible state law changes. But we're operating within the framework we understand right now and within that we're headed towards a better place than we're in at this moment. Uh, my presentation is actually concluded, probably the shortest assessment presentation <laughs> you'll ever have for me, but um, happy to take questions or uh, turn it back over to you. And you know, when we talked about this in agenda planning, it's because you have to be getting questions about this regularly. It's the single biggest one I get all the time. And it, it, it's frustrating in a way, but understandable. My daughter and some of her teacher friends, as an example, I think until I understood this better from our own team, from Vanessa in particular, there was a point that I had been missing until recently, which is the conflict between kind of fair testing so that you go deeper and not just have multiple choice questions so that you can, as this is headed towards more accountability for teachers, right or wrong, there's a, a fairness issue there that is, they don't want to be at odds with. You don't want to be measured strictly on a, on a, on a multiple choice test. So I mean, but there's trade-offs to that, as as uh, Vanessa said. So that's an example of something. And then certainly most people, I could tell even at that alliance again yesterday, as many times as we've been over this, I think most people aren't understanding the conflict in the law in a way that which law don't we follow? Do we not follow the give a college entrance exam law, or do we not follow? So I mean, that's the more folks understand that it's kind of okay. We get it. We don't like it, and we can make it through this year. But if everything falls into place the way it seems to be, this will be dramatically reduced by next year. So 
questions from board or comments? Well, yes, ma'am. Thanks, Vanessa. This really clarifies things, but I want the business with, with SAT being the new test. From what I've read, they're not, they haven't developed it. They're still working on the test. Can that, can we work with them so that they cover our standards? Um, that, so that is our intent as our contractor is to work with them about how we can, how we can get to um, where that test is more aligned with our standards or to, uh, to establish the alignment or to understand the alignment um, and what it, what it will look like. So that's, that's our that's hope. our hope, so then that we could eliminate the extra test, that, except for social studies. Right. I think going all the way to eliminate additional testing is still, we're probably too early in the process to say that, because again, we just don't have enough information, but uh, reduce, certainly, with it is something we could work toward. Well, that would be an improvement, I think. Mm -hmm. A big one. I know, I know a lot of people are unhappy about the switch, but the, <coughs> the ball bounces, I guess. Thank you. Melody, please. There was a teacher that asked a question um, at the events ed conference where Superintendent Flanagan was speaking, and it really has resonated with me. So I think this would be a good time to kind of ask or get a little more information. Um, you know, teachers are being told that with the new standards and everything, it, it's not about what you know. It's about what you can do with what you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with kids having access to smartphones and information at, the, at their fingertips, it's not so much about regurgitating facts because they can find those. So the teacher was wondering, you know, how, how will the tests be different? Um, and how can you assess kids? Because they can't have their smartphone on a test. So if, you're, if they're still being asked questions about what year a war happened or, you know, very specific things that they can find easily, um, we're kind of stuck in this limbo and, and how that would be addressed on the new assessment or how that can be addressed in future assessments. Um, I think there's there's two pieces to that, and one is, uh, and we've we've done this in ELA and math. We've adopted newer standards that the standards themselves focus less on small details and more on understanding how to process information, and how to think, um, how to, the deeper knowledge. Then the question is, how do you build an assessment that does that? And so, um, the, our assessment here seeks to get into um, that type of work where you have to work with the knowledge and work with the the pieces in new ways. Um, but the, the first thing is to have standards that actually ask for that, because if you still have a set of standards that ask for, do you know the date of whatever, then that becomes a piece that you have to assess on. So I think the work that this board has done around standards for Michigan is is really important and, and is part of getting us to, it's not the test, it's the what we want kids to know and having kind of cohesion around that as a state in, in terms of the standards. And then, um, you know, you're kind of getting into what sort of assessment types and how do you do that, but it's really those, that performance tasks, those classroom activities, um, they're not coming online this year because we're still bringing them online, but some of the technology enhanced items that are in the pipeline for, for future years for development, so, um, or are they coming online this year? Technology enhanced, I'm sorry. They're coming online for okay. the math and the ELA. Right. So technology enhanced items, things like that new item types. And that was one of the things um, in the last four years that has been exciting about having the, the, the new standards and the ability to kind of collaborate with other states around uh, what sort of item types we can do to get into a new type of assessment. So on our website, uh, I don't have it here, but on the BAA website or the michigan.gov backslash BAA, um, there are a lot of sample tests and things and, and teachers, it, we would encourage people to go on and interact with those and understand what this looks like. It's a little bit better than me trying to explained about it but why don't we send question. all of you that link yep. later today we'll send you the link if you're interested in pursuing that John yeah, please um, so you, you helped understand the awkward year we're in at the high school level of testing and opportunity to streamline it um, in the future are there are there concerns out there about the time on test at the lower grades and are there any opportunities to kind of keep streamlining mm -hmm. what we're doing there yeah I think I think there are some. Um, they don't have to take the college entrance and the the work keys, um, so that's a reduction. Again, the challenge that I'm hearing from the field in the younger grades is this addition of performance tasks. So it's back to the point Mike made a minute ago about that tension of and what Melody just said about having kids in, interact with the material in new ways, but that increases some testing time. So I think one thing that should help with that to some degree is the fact that for the 80% that are online, 
um, they can schedule things and it doesn't have to happen all at once. And so we're hoping that schools will take advantage of some of that flexibility to put together a schedule that makes sense for them. Um, I think we need to just continue to have a dialogue about, about this. I will underscore, though, that we are not doing any testing that we're not required to do. So Michigan is not testing anywhere in any subject outside of the minimal requirements of federal and state law. Um, That's a great bottom line statement, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. I'll take my <coughs> Michelle and then Kathleen. Um, I just had a couple questions. Someone asked me, the ACT you can repeat, take over again at the SAT. Um, my understanding is that once you take it, you can't retake it and get the better score. Uh, in terms of the, so there's, there's two pieces, right? There's what we offer as part of the state right. system. And in the state system, you can't retake. You, you know, your state score is your state right. score. Um, I believe SAT allows you to retake, though, outside of the state system. And, and get the best score. Um, I think, well, that would get into yeah. what the colleges want you to report, I think. That's yeah. more, think that's less of a testing issue, more of a college issue. Some, some would say send us your best, and some would say send us all, and we'll average. Okay, because I thought there was a difference between the two. But I, I also had a couple other questions, and one was, um, so I, I really like the a couple of the ideas you were talking about, and mm -hmm. one was, um, you know, holding off this uh, this year on um, labeling schools. Will that also apply to teachers and administrators? Um, I'm writing down your, your first question. Oh, sorry. Um, <coughs> so, in terms of educator evaluations, uh, you know, we do have a state law that requires that all educators be evaluated each year using um, observations <coughs> and student growth data from local assessments and from state assessments where available. Um, given when the testing time happens this year, it, it's not available in the window in which the evaluations are being conducted. So we would encourage districts to look at prior years, you know, prior data on that teacher as well as really heavily rely on their local data in a transition year. And I wanted to second something Kathy said about um, merging the, um, the college entrance exam hopefully maybe someday using it to replace the, um, you know, the, whatever the test is going to be in high school, the state test, um, because a, a lot of people have brought up the fact that there's no motivation or very little mm -hmm. motivation for kids to do well on these state standardized tests where maybe a college entrance exam test, it, they would uh, take it more seriously and it would be a better reflection. So I think that, that moving to that is great. And the final thing I'm going to say is I've also been reading where there's some initiatives to look at random sampling mm -hmm. instead of standardized tests um, as well, and um, also trying to gather data in a as we have more and more online. Um, and I think there's there's other self assessments that schools do on top of all this other stuff, mm -hmm. and whatever all those tests that come to mind that aren't here, but mm -hmm. as part of the regime of the schools. Um, so I'm hoping that can help because the disruptions that I'm hearing. It's not just the test day, it's the fact that, you know, like my kids, when even when they're not being tested, sometimes they won't have school because they want to keep the school quiet for the other kids, mm -hmm. or they're moved to an auditorium and they're not getting instruction, they're not getting the time in the computer lab because it's, you know, and so it just, one day, even though it's one grade, it, it can just, dis depending on the school, it can be really disruptive to all the other students where I'm, you know, I, I, been battling my kids about attending school even though they're not you know they, they don't want to be in that environment um, so uh, so I, I think it's not just the hours that are counted it's also um, disruptive when another class another grade is being tested in the school and I think it has the fact that it's such high stakes it's like this intensity that um, so I it, so I think anything to, to deal with that and, and look moving towards maybe random sampling like the NAEP or other ways in the future. And at, I mean, I know we have laws, but we can also advocate for change mm -hmm. and give our expert advice on that. And I think that would be something worth considering and pursuing. Mm -hmm. so, um, I know that that has been a piece that's floated through the federal ESCA, this concept of you know more test certain kids, other kids. 
I, I think again, going back to my previous statement, like I said, we're we're doing we're not doing anything outside of what's required by law, and <coughs> random sampling is not allowed now. I think that's a good discussion. I think we need to be honest about what we can and can't do then with those data. Like NAEP, you can't have school level information. You can only have state level information, which if that's what we all agree we want to do with our assessments, then that's okay. Uh, my big pitch right now that I keep saying to groups is we just have to agree on the purposes of the assessment and then the assessment can be built. So if you build an assessment to do that does random sampling and then you say, well, did this school get an A or a B or a color or whatever, we can't tell you that. So let's just be, you know, trying to be clear at the outset of what we can do with the thing. And I know that's maybe what some of us would prefer and I'm, to use Mike's term, I'm agnostic. Truly, well, we can build it however it is, but I think sometimes what happens in this conversation is we don't think about how it all fits together and then it's, well, we have too much testing time or why don't we do this other thing? And really it's that we're not coherent about being able, you know, does, does, the, does the tool support the use? And having that conversation really, really consistently is an important part. So I appreciate you raising the, the points. I'm actually Catholic but agnostic on this issue. The, uh, <laughs> I do think, Michelle, you're really on to something that I recommend to the legislative committee we spend some time on because we can help influence this. I, in a couple of meetings I've been in with leaders, new leaders in the House and Senate recently, you can see they're not, they, they need guidance and help in terms of wanting to get, I think, in large part to the same end result we do. So the more that we can paint that picture that you just heard Vanessa describe and that you're pushing for, I think the better we're, we're more likely to get that result in state law anyway. The national stuff is our associations, as you know, more than anything. So your association, my association, to influence through them would be helpful. Um, Richard, you were next, sir. Oh, no, Kathleen was next, then Richard. Yeah, well, you said something, Vanessa, that I thought was, was worth repeating. Uh, when we said we're, we're not going to label this right now, we're not going to label schools we're using for evaluation, and they're going to be used for seeing how well the students do, how well do they understand what they're learning. That was the original purpose of the standardized test. Mm -hmm. When the MEEP was first established, it was to be a diagnostic test mm -hmm. to help the teachers figure out what they had to do differently to get reach all the kids. That would be a big improvement if we didn't use it for all these other purposes. But I know now it's being used to rate, rank the schools and all. But to use it for diagnostic purposes would be very helpful mm -hmm. if the test is a good test. Mm -hmm. But the other, the other point I wanted to make was that uh, there was on a conference call yesterday with NASB's Government Affairs Committee on the ESEA. And uh, Senator Alexander, the, the chairman of the uh, Senate Health Education and Labor Committee, uh, is still still hasn't said whether he wants to change the it, mandate for every year testing. Mm -hmm. He seems to be not happy with every year testing, and he may they may put something in the bill that says it's not required anymore. Now, whether that's going to be the end, of the end result, I don't know, because mm -hmm. there are also people saying that you need it in order to measure. Mm -hmm. So, right. but that's apparently uh, a big if at this point. I think the, the country's engaged in a dialogue about how much testing do we need and that balance between right. regular measurement of performance, which helps us drive goals, but not overly burdensome measurement of performance. Right. And on your first point about the diagnostic, and we'll talk more about this in flex, like I said, but we aren't saying we never use it for another high stakes purpose. We're saying this year we would like to, um, in this transition year, not use it to make these high stakes decisions. So, and we'll talk more about our long range plans in the next presentation. Oh, well, our hopes in the <laughs> plans and hopes. It would be nice if the tests we use for diagnostic mm -hmm. purposes. And can I? Uh, I lost my train of thought there, so I'm going to go right to Richard and then Cassandra. I'll come back to it. I just, <clears throat> I just want to um, uh, share a concern. Um, you know, the the uh, multiple choice questions, as I understand it, are um, they're they're quicker and easier. Uh, you can you can have a machine, you know, count up all the bubbles, and uh, but the real uh, advantage of these kinds of tests is that they are reliable and the difficulty with the longer so-called authentic uh, testing is that uh, the results then are become less reliable 
and we have to it's ironic but you get less consistent results the more these longer uh, and more diverse kinds of activities um, so so this 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 problem of too much time on testing has arisen as a result of well-intended reforms of testing which actually make the testing less valuable um, if we if we uh, like a physical test like like stature um, uh, or maybe a better yet a medical test like temperature uh, is one factor among many that that gives us a clue as to the patient's health and condition and, and changes and responding to uh, to medicine and things like that that originally was the kind of measure these tests were intended to be and and now we're confusing it with an entire um, uh, head to toe uh, evaluation and 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 that's going to lead to 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 problems uh, such as we have, you know, too much time on testing the te and we don't know what the testing means. Um, so I, I think it would be helpful just to go back to, you know, a, a standardized test is but one measure rather than over-reliance on, mm -hmm. on test scores per se. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so in mm -hmm. terms of where testing fits in our thinking in the future. And as testing becomes more unmanageable, then then there's the the thought of uh, throwing the baby out with the bath. Mm -hmm. But if we do this, I mean, I do think it's important. Today was meant to say what is, you know, and help give ammunition about why we're all kind of where we are. But I do think it would be helpful at legislative committee and also at the board to have a further dialogue on where we would like it to be and why, and then help inform a new legislature along those lines. And we could talk in agenda planning about where to try to put that. If that's helpful. Because I do, these are, we're really aligned on this a lot already with some of our discussion in house. But even where we're not, we should figure this out together and then, and then set a plan. Cassandra, you were next. Yeah, so I have a question, but before I do that, I just want to make a statement. Um, I think this is one of those issues where we have a lot of bipartisan agreement across the board on um, you know, what we'd like to see the future direction of testing. So I think this is something that we could do a lot of work around. So I appreciate your comments, Richard. Um, Question, quick question. This is what happens when you see right. them closer together. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> He's on your, your side of the table. Marilyn's, not, Marilyn's very well, smart. Well. Uh, so if we're not using this upcoming test uh, to label, does that mean we're also not doing the top to bottom list? Yes. Okay. And again, we'll hit that in the next presentation in greater detail. Got it. Okay. Um, That's and, all and I And this is a fairness issue. We're just trying to say how can we reconcile in our own minds right. that okay. when, you know, last year's test is this is different, next year will be different again. I mean, this is even why not naming schools. I mean, how are you going to name schools under kind of this regime of change mm -hmm. uh, in, yeah. into those? And can I just mention the, the one I did forget for a moment was just – partly because I was remembering the 200 local board meetings where I was superintendent <laughs> and remembering that we had measures anyway, but sometimes it was by the realtors and others who had their own motives. And in, in this case, uh, you know, we've got bridge, we've got realtors, you've got others. So, I mean, there's a point where we would want to best design what we think are the right measures and let others do that also, you know, to have their say. But it's, it's my point is, if we didn't take a lead on this, there's still going to be measures, and people are going to be deciding who are the good schools and who are the bad schools. And I think, uh, you know, that's something we can enlighten people about. I think one of the contributions Bridge is making is, is trying to take into account some other factors beyond what we take into account. You look at how schools are doing, particularly with poor kids, and how they're making gains. So these are these can all be good the same way that you might assess. Uh, Richard's better at analogies than I am, but I, you might assess a team based on not just one factor, you know, what the, the pitching or the, the average, the batting average for the team. You look at multiple. But I, I would just say it's not like it's going to go away if suddenly we didn't have this. There's other people that will always have measures for schools, and I can remember being troubled that supposedly we weren't as good as Novi, and all the measures we looked at and tried to push were, yes, we were. And we were in some areas we had some work to do, but we would have 
always preferred something that had a kind of a state uh, acknowledgement on it that would well, that's, I mean, you're raising the issue of data in general. You can manipulate data to get to show you the results that you want. That's why multiple measures are really important because right. anyone can take numbers and then, you know, right. measure what they want to measure to get the outcome that they want to get. That's right. So I just had a quick yes, ma question to clarify. <clears throat> so if there's no top to bottom list, if somebody was in the <clears throat> bottom Five percent last year. Is, is it a pause button? It's not just like an extension of last year, right? It's just a pause. Why don't you speak to that, Can can I ask that we cover that in the next presentation? Oh, sure. it, it is part of our. I probably should have merged these. Yeah. Or Why don't we move to that if you don't mind? I mean, these are interrelated. You can still ask questions related to this because they're kind of. We almost put them as one item together, right? Or, or was there something specifically on this? I, I just Hannah, had a please. simple question in regard to the work keys, and so that will still be intact in 2016. Mm -hmm. ACT mm -hmm. will be okay. Um, the will work keys the will be the work skills assessment in 2016. Okay, and then the college entrance will be SAT. Okay. So why don't we, again, it's, these are related anyway, and we wanted to, I think I dropped the ball a few years ago, and since then I think we deserve credit for making sure that the board's on top of what we're thinking and gets feedback uh, that we can acknowledge into our applications for flexibility and the rest. So this is an example of that. We've got till the end of March, but you'll hear a little bit of that presentation. Natasha's going to join. Abby's going to join us at the table. Abby's kind of our lead on this and has done a, a great job, historically has done a great job. This is, this is hurting cats because you'll see in terms of this, we're going to the associations, we're going to others, as you would expect, to try to build this together. And um, with that in mind, it's, it's to update you on the ESEA flexibility <coughs> renewal process, timelines and implications, as well as the purpose of amendments to Michigan's current request. So, so good morning. Uh, we are, as Mike uh, just spoke to, we're going to talk about the uh, flexibility renewal process. Our objective is basically to um, discuss the processes, timelines, and proposed changes. Um, if you're interested in knowing what the waiver is for, it's a waiver for the No Child Left Behind 2001 programming restrictions. There are essentially three principles um, that we will discuss at a level of detail here today. The first is college and career ready expectations. The second is about state develops. I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I was going to say this before you started. Yep. As I was going through this the other day, the question I kept coming up with, is this MDE's recommendation to the feds or the feds recommendation to MDE? So as you're going through the, the thing, can you kind of, that'll save me from asking you 15 questions at the end. Yep. Okay, so this you. is, these are um, our recommendations. So we have flexibility to to actually propose what we would like to do to close the achievement gap and to prepare um, a much higher skilled workforce. Um, and so you're going to hear the proposed changes that we're, we are drafting at the state level for Michigan. And so this isn't a top-down uh, sort of, you know, uh, these are not top-down restrictions that are being placed on us. We are actually doing the work here at the department to identify um, the particular components that will allow us to close the achievement gap. And so we're going to speak to how we want to um, do that work. But, but there are some criteria that they're right. asking that be in the waiver from the federal government is asking that we address. There are. How to address it is up to us. Exactly. And so there are essentially three principles um, to your point. And the first is around college and career readiness. The second is about around state developed accountability um, and recognition. And the third is around effective instruction and leadership. And so those are the parameters and the infrastructure by which we are designing um, a much stronger sense of how we get at closing the achievement gap. Isn't the federal government saying you have to tie test scores, standardized test scores, to um, teacher evaluations? Yeah, I'll let so Vanessa speak some, to that. Some part. of it is pretty prescriptive. I mean, it's not just general. So, so as we work for each of the principles, we can talk through some of okay. the requirements. Like, okay, like so. Natasha said, though, um, while there are requirements in this, because this is the federal government's negotiation with us mm -hmm. um, around how we either follow NCLB or follow something else, um, we really do believe this is very. We really do believe it. Op it gives us this opportunity to further our own priorities. Okay. So understand 
and we listed some of them out up there, um, understand how, what they, where they're a strong requirement from them. And there are a few, and we'll, to your point, Cassandra, call out where this is okay. a strong okay. federal thing. But then there's a lot of flexibility in how we get there. <coughs> so, and like Natasha just said, when you think about the core principles, students being career and college ready, that's our, that's our mission statement here at the department adopted by the, the board as well. It's the board's mission statement as well, graduate ready for college careers and community. That we close achievement gaps, that we increase early literacy, and then we have a workforce that can do these things. Those are the concepts in FLEX, and they're concepts that we uh, articulate in our priorities here. So we'll be, in this presentation, though, to your point, we'll call out where there's a strong requirement and that. where it's our. Um, and I would say be between NCLB and FLEX, FLEX has a lot more places for us to choose. NCLB was like, this is it, mm -hmm. and it, this is it. <laughs> there's no choice in the matter. Flex really does say, here's some core concepts about how you get there, what's your timeline, and in our experience dealing with U.S. Ed, um, especially right now, they're at a place where they're really working with states to get states to a system that's meaningful. So we want to take this as an opportunity to try to drive toward that. No, I think that we're good. Um, so kind of alluding to to what uh, Cassandra was just asking and, and what some of you might be wondering, do we, do we have to do this? Um, do we have to do ESEA Flex? And the short answer is no. Um, states who wish to receive title dollars, so title one, two, three, six, um, but don't participate, choose not to participate in ESEA flexibility, uh, can choose to implement the original no child left behind requirements. Um, and we have some impacts to review at the end. Abby's gonna go through some of that if we were to do that. Um, but the short answer is we don't have to do this, but like we just talked about, we do think that this, better than No Child Left Behind, by itself, helps us achieve our goals as a state. We'd like a chance to share with you how we can see that working. So just a few nuts and bolts be before we get into some of our uh, proposed content um, that we'll be bringing forth in, in this renewal process. Uh, just a little bit about the timeline under which we're working right now. Um, if you'll recall, our original request was approved back in July of 2020. Um, between now and then, we have undergone three amendment processes plus an extension, which is taking us through the end of the current school year. Um, so our renewal request is due to uh, U.S. Ed on March 31st of this year. Uh, and upon approval of that renewal request, um, our ESEA flexibility will be uh, extended through the end of the 2017-2018 school year. Um, as part of the process, we are undergoing, as we have before, uh, extensive stakeholder engagement activities, and that's for a, a dual purpose, really. Um, first is to get feedback on our implementation to date, how we've been doing, what's been working, what's not been working, um, and we're actually in a, in a really good place here um, from the get-go, um, whereas some states got approval, and this is the first time they're going back out to make changes. Like I said, we've... we've made changes four times now. So we've been in constant dialogue with, with our stakeholders about what's working and what's not working, and have demonstrated a willingness to make changes um, to, to make the entire process better. Um, we are going out, uh, I'm sorry, the second part um, is talking specifically about the proposed changes to the renewal requests. So with our various stakeholder groups, um, we are presenting much of the same content that we'll, that we'll be talking about today and just getting feedback. And, and what that process feeds into then is we kind of go through um, the development of the content, we initiate a draft that we then take it back out to stakeholders and say, here's what we've come up with, so that the public comment period in mid-March, um, just a couple weeks before it's due, is really kind of the culminating activity that we should see reflected in there all the work that we've done with stakeholders to date um, and kind of put one last public call for what do you think here um, before we send it out, uh, out to U.S. Ed. We, I, I will add on to what Abby just said because I've had this question from groups. We do, in that, like she just went through, in that stakeholder engagement time and then the public comment, we, we are putting forward, well, you'll see today our proposed solution here. But this is truly a time of engagement and modification and discussion with our stakeholders. So I had a group say, well, you guys have already decided, right? And I said, no, actually, that's we, we have something on paper we'd like to discuss with you. But this is truly a time to work with the field and, and work with the board. And, and that's why we're here in, in February um, um, and look forward to working with everybody, really, to the extent that we can on this. Uh, it will be a successful plan for Michigan if we have some coherence around how it's helping us reach our core goals. Not, you know. So moving to principle one. Um, it 
yes, sorry. <laughs> uh, the career and college ready expectations for all students, or college and career ready expectations for all students. So this is, Cassandra, the language from um, ESCA flexibility itself. So that states must demonstrate their continued commitment to ensure that all students graduate from high school ready for college and careers. And we need to do this through implementation of career and college ready standards and assessments. Yep. Isn't that an ACT thing though? Career and college ready? Um, we're it, moving to SAT. How do we measure career and college ready if we're not using the assessment in which that's based on? Mm -hmm. So in this, <coughs> outside of ACT, SAT, in this context, it's two things. It's standards that, um, <coughs> high quality standards that talk about what students need to know and be able to do in, in this world. So we have that through our Michigan standards, which you all adopted. And then it is assessments that measure those standards and that set the cut points, set the standards at a level that indicates a student has a reasonable chance of being successful in college. <coughs> so that so cut score discussion we did back in 2011 with the board and, yeah. and your support on that. So the U.S. Department, th this is where my confusion always comes okay. in. We're all using the same language, but it's coming from very different places. So the U.S. Department of Education just adopted the language, not necessarily where it came from, which was ACT. I think, I, I, yes, I mean, okay. I don't. I mean, they're not saying use ACT with this. They're saying have your cut score, have your standards and your cut score on the test mean something about preparedness for um, beyond high school. Okay. Because what's one thing we know under NCLB is it didn't always, right? You, we had a lot of students who were proficient on tests, and Michigan was probably in the middle of the pack on this, but some states set the cut scores so low that that meant nothing. A proficient student was not ready for anything beyond that. This was their effort to say, well, let's have it meaningful for a graduate. Okay. And, and I think... Our standards, ACT, the standards that they're trying to build in, the SAT, as it moves to be a standards-based test, all are trying to get to the same place, which is what are the set of competencies that are good proxies for being ready to take the next step into work or community college or university without needing remediation. There's a long way to go on all of those fronts to get them all in the right place, but we're all trying to get to the same set of standards. And so, I mean, this I, yeah, I'm, I'm not questioning any yeah. of that. I'm questioning you're using language that came from a specific place, so it's just confusing. That's all I'm saying. I think, okay, I think that's a, a good a good point about the way the language kind of interrelates on this topic. So. Um, so I will make one more note on standards and testing, and then I'll turn it over to Natasha to talk a little bit more about this principle. Um, ESCA flexibility, this was a question that came up, has come up a lot in the last four years. Uh, it does not require a certain set of standards or a certain type of assessments. So it doesn't say you have to adopt any given standards or any certain assessment. You don't have to join a consortia. You don't have to do anything. What you do have to, to Cassandra's point before, you do have to have standards that focus on career and college readiness, either... Um, either through adopting standards that are agreed to relate to career and college readiness or by having your um, the colleges and universities in your state look at your standards and say, yes, these are good standards. Uh, that was the, some state just recently used that model. I can't, Oklahoma, thank you. Oklahoma recently used that model. And you also have an assessment that can measure those standards. So this has been a point that a lot of people, you know, the waiver made us do X, Y, or Z. The waiver made us have career and college ready standards or ask that we have career and college ready standards and that we'd be able to assess them, but not with any certain brand of those two things. Um, and again, we really do think that the career and college ready standards and assessments align with NDE's mission. And this board has supported so many things over, over the last years moving toward that for Michigan students. So we know that you hold that dear to your heart as well. Um, and then the, the, our current testing structure, and I alluded to this before, but it's not actually mandated by FLEX. It's mandated by No Child Left Behind, a mix of No Child Left Behind and state law. So the testing in science once per grade level is a No Child Left Behind requirement, not a flex requirement. So this gets a little confusing, and I know there's just been a lot of concerns about assessment, so I just wanted to call out what flex was doing to us, which really is not much in the testing world aside from having an assessment that can measure those standards. Um, the timing and the quantity comes from NCLB and state law. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we're going to talk about proposed new content that's largely around programming. Um, we talked a lot today about assessment um, and high stakes testing basically, but principle one um, also includes just what does it take to get kids ready for college and careers. And part of that is having 
um, you know, understanding when kids read, who reads well, um, and what those proficiency levels are in time to intervene. And so that first bullet really speaks to statewide, a statewide initiative targeting third grade reading proficiency. So far, um, we have identified literacy experts in the state of Michigan, pulled them together, and talked through the five foundations of reading, which include comprehension, phonemic awareness, phonics, as well as fluency. Um, and vocabulary. And so we are now in a place where we are going to identify just what would it take to create a cohesive uh, literacy initiative across the <coughs> state of Michigan um, to really get kids reading by third grade and um, to know where kids are before then. Um, and even if they aren't reading by third grade, we need to identify those kids earlier so we can intervene faster and much more intensely. Um, and so that statewide initiative targeting third grade reading proficiency is um, a huge component to one of the proposed content changes. The second content change you see up there is updates to Michigan's multi-tiered system of support initiative. Um, for many of you guys who are familiar with MTSS, that basically speaks to three tiers of intervention. Um, that first or that uh, level or tiered one uh, intervention is known as universal interventions, um, whereby we look at, we're providing quality instruction for the vast majority of kids. As that occurs, what teachers tend to do is they progress monitor along the way so they know which kids need more rigorous instruction versus which kids need more intensive intervention. Those kids who need more intensive intervention will float up to what's known as tier two uh, interventions. Um, and that is that has to do with a strategic group of interventions that takes place at that level. Um, as instruction continues to occur, so does progress monitoring. And what teachers will identify are kids who need even more intervention. And those kids are identified um, at level or tier three. And tier three in an MTSS system that is fully functional and um, implemented with fidelity is called intensive individual intervention. Uh, um, and so MTSS is one of the support initiatives that we are proposing as new content um, in this particular waiver. Um, and we are working collaboratively with ISDs and other stakeholder groups to make sure that districts know how to do this well. And again, it's really a way to identify where kids are early enough to intervene with the right interventions for the right kids. Um, the third bullet up there speaks to updates to professional learning for teachers and principals. Um, that includes coaching, leadership support, culture and climate interventions. Um, we're also looking at ways to use what's called surveys of enacted curriculum. Um, many states use uh, the surveys of enacted curriculum to really identify the instructional practices that are used across uh, different classrooms. Um, again, these are all um, variables that also contribute to how well we are implementing not just interventions but delivering quality instruction. Um, the last bullet up there speaks to um, a proposed new change for college readiness, and that's post-secondary ac access um, and persistent data and supports. And so understanding what options are available for kids is hugely important, not just for the adults to know, but also for kids to be invested in what happens after high school um, and during high school in order to prepare them for a knowledge-based society where they need to be highly skilled workers in order to be successful. And so these are some proposed new content changes, again, um, that uh, are hugely important in terms of student outcomes and college readiness. Principle two moves us into um, the, the state developed systems of differentiated recognition, accountability, and support. So this is where, um, back with the original flexibility, we moved away from AYP to some of the priority focus reward labeling and some other things like that. Uh, so in terms of the flex renewal, what the federal government is saying, we need to demonstrate our continued commitment to continuous improvement of systems and processes that support the implementation of this system. Uh, recognition, accountability, and support. For us, that means it's time to take a look at the accountability, recognition, and support system like we have been, to Abby's point, over the last four years. We've made a lot of our changes have been made in this principle and see if it's still uh, supporting our goals as a state in the, in the most effective way. So we have some proposed new content here, so some things we'd like to do. And one I already hit on in the testing presentation, so I'll, I'd like to describe it a little more here. 
Uh, we would like to move from an annual identification of priority focus and reward schools to a three-year identification cycle. So instead of naming every year, we would name every third year, essentially. That would make our next year in which we would name new priority focus and reward schools the fall of 2017 for the 2017-18 school year, um, which would be, as well, after two years of data from the same assessment. We would like to actively work with US Ed, with the legislature, with everybody to try to support uh, a concept that we, um, we don't make high stakes decisions about, uh, about schools, districts, or teachers until we have at least two years of data from a stable assessment. So to Mike's point about transitioning from MEEP to MSTEP, that's two different assessments. Um, next year we may have a different assessment too, so making 2016 kind of the baseline year getting at least two years of, of data from a stable assessment so people know what to expect. That's a general principle. Applying that principle here would put us at fall of 17 with the next naming of the cohort. We also um, want to, aside from the assessment transition, we want to in the long run be in a three-year identification cycle to allow us to target resources in the interim years, allow schools to have some chance to understand, some warning, some <laughs> chance to prepare to change their practice and have there be less frequent times when we uh, apply those labels. This is something US Ed um, supports in their guidance, um, so we feel confident about it in terms of US Ed, but are uh, curious to see what the field thinks. So far, we've had positive, <laughs> positive response, um, but again, would, would love to hear the feedback of the board on this and other things. Um, we also are considering new metrics to identify focus schools, and I believe I talk about that more on the next slide, so I'll skip to that. Um, let me talk a little bit about this, sorry, let me talk about this chart and then I'll take your question if that's okay, Dr. Ziley. Um, this would be the proposed accountability cycle going forward. So in the fall of 2015, what would we report publicly? Um, possibly some sort of parent dashboard. This is something that's come up in various conversations and maybe on those non-naming years, we make some information available, maybe some multiple measures to the point of the board, some things that people are interested in that aren't assessment data. And we don't apply a label or a designation to it, we just say here's some information. Um, we also will have to report state level assessment results as part of the federal reporting. We would report securely to districts and schools their scorecard, so they'd still get the information on their scorecard. Um, they would get a at-risk of priority and focus notification, so we would run top to bottom, but we wouldn't publish it. We would say to the schools, you know, you're in the bottom 10%, so you're at risk of priority. You're in the bottom 20% of gap, you're at risk of focus. And then there is student level information. Again, the purpose is for them to use it to understand what's going on, what's not. Um, in this very first year, it would be partly to work with us on how are the data behaving, do they, you know, let's, let's talk about this. And then the accountability consequences would be none, unless you do not participate. We need to make sure that people participate and take the assessment each year. That's a federal requirement. It's also important if we're going to use the data diagnostically, we have to have the data from the kids. And we have to take advantage of the chance as a state to have a low stakes year where we still participate in the assessment. <clears throat> Moving over to fall 2016, it would look almost identical. And then fall 2017, we would publish a priority focus reward school list. Um, potentially some sort of scorecard as well for all the other schools. Schools would still get their student level information securely because that's never public. And then the accountability consequence at that point would be entry into priority and focus status. And then we would start the cycle again. So 18, 19, 20. Um, moving on to focus. Focus has been one of the things that has been the most interesting part of the flex discussion to me. And we all remember the initial focus list. I um, appreciate Mike's leadership with the initial focus list because that was a, a tough conversation to have with the state. Schools who had not previously been named because of average high performance all of a sudden were on a list and that was a very difficult conversation. Uh, we've been having it over the last few years. We've made some modifications to how we calculate it and what we do. But when you, although nobody loves this list, when you talk to the field about how it's changed the conversation in their districts, how it's changed the conversation in their schools, there's a lot of positive movement to focus on kids who are being left behind. That being said, we want to be um, authentic and appropriate and investigate what we could do better, what, what, we could, um, what differences we could make with this metric. So just a quick reminder, right now what you do is you identify that bottom 30% of students, and then you look at the gap between the bottom 30% and the top 30%. 
Um, some possible new metrics that we would like to propose, still looking at that gap, but removing schools from consideration for focus if their bottom 30% has either met a proficiency target or a growth target. So if your bottom 30% is getting a certain amount of growth, then okay, even if there's a gap, because that means you're raising the achievement of your lowest performing kids. The other thing we're floating is calculating it for only English language arts and math. So right now all the subjects fit into it, but this would allow us to focus more, to focus, again, more strategically on those core initiatives, allow schools to target their resources more effectively. I am almost done, I promise. This is the guts of, of this, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you guys won't have me back to the board meeting next month. Uh, scorecard reporting options. We would like to consider with everyone a possible move from colors to an A to F grading system. Obviously, that this is a huge um, focus of, of many in the education community. It's also in, uh, something many in the education community don't like. What the department is putting out there is we would like to try to find agreement about what sort of labeling system makes sense. Not to overuse the agnostic word, but we are agnostic. We can use colors, we can use labels, we can use nothing, but we don't want to have disparate systems and we don't want to continue to be in a debate over what's a lime green school if we can't all agree that lime's an important way to designate. So we are putting that out there for open discussion so that when we come back we can establish a label that makes sense for Michigan. Just as a point of interest, if you want to know, 14 states do use an A to F grading system, like Florida. Eight use levels, one to five, Massachusetts is, a, is an example of that. And the rest use some mix of between three to five labels of exemplary, good, or needs improvement, whatever. We are the only state that uses colors, so <laughs> yay for us. Um, <laughs> we're unique. <laughs> but, but truthfully, you know, what is a level two versus a lime? I mean, at some level, it's, you're talking about all the same thing. Uh, so all we as a department want to do is stop fighting a, a battle over colors. If we don't want colors as a state, fine, but what is it that we want? Let's just all decide. We're good. Okay, so we uh, talked a little bit about um, proposed new content um, for priority schools in previous uh, presentations. And we have done some work around uh, the country just in terms of looking at what high performing schools do or high gain schools do in other parts of the country. So we've been to Memphis, we've been to Boston, um, we have a clear sense of what's working and what's not working. So there's no need to really repeat um, mistakes that folks have already made. Um, and so we are looking uh, during this interim year at what a district focused uh, support system or turnaround intervention process might look like. And for us, that means increased autonomy for superintendents with um, clear expectations and increased uh, accountability as well. Right now, we identify priority schools, um, and we don't really look at priority districts, whereas other parts of the country, they really have a closer relationship with uh, district superintendents where priority schools are housed. Um, and so we are looking at um, how we can identify uh, district level supports. Um, and so that would be um, us moving to a more district-focused turnaround intervention uh, model uh, for local superintendents and to work more collaboratively, collaboratively with them earlier um, so they know where their schools are and know what the options um, are in terms of how to intervene faster. Um, we are, we're also working across the department to identify what those five levels of intervention supports could look like. Um, and I say we're continuously working because we've identified what those could be, um, but we are still um, connecting with the Office of Evaluation and Strategic Research to make sure that it makes the most sense given that we're um, where we are with assessments. Um, and so the exit criteria from priority and focus status is also something that we are talking through. Um, we don't want to just say this is how you become a priority school or priority district. We also want to have clear expectations about how you transition out of priority status um, given that we are entering a new assessment year. Dr. Zeiler. Quick question. This five levels of intervention, is that something that's spelled out in law? No, that is um, what we've done. We are in the process of scripting out what that looks like. Um, yeah. Currently, there were a lot of prior, there were a lot of criterion 
uh, criteria that we've put into the flexibility waiver that was very restrictive for schools and districts, a lot of paperwork, a lot of compliance, and that really didn't focus on programming and how to develop um, a high-performing district or a high-performing school. Um, and so what we've done is we've pulled a lot of that comp compliant, those compliance pieces out, and we've said let's work with district-level leaders um, to allow for them to understand what high-gain uh, schools do in different parts of the country that are reflective of their student demographic and let's give them the space and time to do that work all while identifying what the expectations are and what the criteria are to meet those expectations. How hard and fast is the is the five levels as opposed to three and here is, is just a thought running through my mind you know a lot of public officials school board members are elected for four years so if it's three years, you can hold the same people accountable. If it's five years, well, they'll be replaced. And uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm sure that has something to do with uh, an organization's continued commitment. So, so uh, if I'm hearing the question correctly, I think you're referring to the three years um, of assessments um, that we are using versus these five levels of intervention um, are about the tiered layers of support that we provide depending on how well students perform, which okay. is a different bucket than the, the two years or three years of assessment data we would need to have reliable information around kids. Okay. So these five levels are around intervention um, support, in supports that allow us to um, it's a way to identify who needs what supports, differentiating assistance, right? So if all five of you are different students, um, you might be functioning at a different level than Dr. Ziley, than Michelle, than Cassandra. And so we are going to support you based on your particular need. Um, and that will allow us to focus on the high need districts rather than putting all supports into all schools that may just need more autonomy to do the work that they know how to do. Um, is this which five, isn't what we do now. Is the five reflective of some kind of um, uh, structure or, uh, or is it just an arbitrarily chosen number? It's not an arbitrary uh, chosen number. Again, what we did is we looked at what exists currently in the state. Um, it probably would have been helpful for me to just put up the triangle up there, um, but we're in the process of finalizing what those levels look like. Um, so, but in high-performing states, and, and I uh, use that term somewhat loosely, when I say high-performing, I'm just referring to states where students um, are doing exceedingly better or well on their high stakes exams, right? Um, and so in those states, they have they don't give all uh, interventions to the all schools. They identify what schools and districts need and provide the appropriate supports there. And so, um, for example, in Massachusetts, there's a pyramid where um, the level five district is um, a district that is in the bottom five percent. Um, or has schools in the bottom 5% where you um, are at risk of going into what's known as receivership. But that is after several stakeholder meetings, data dialogues, um, interventions, and so forth. Recommendations are made over time rather than as soon as your kids are in the bottom five, you're being recommended to the superintendent or the commissioner in, um, in their state um, for receivership. Cassandra, please. Thank you. Um, who makes the recommendation on what the interventions are? Because that was one of the complaints about NCLB was you were forced into certain sanctions whether that was your problem or not. So the, the great thing about this proposed new content is that we are um, confident in our district level and school level leaderships, uh, teams, that they fundamentally understand what their kids need. Right? I'm not in Muskegon every day, regardless of what my background is in urban ed and at-risk kids. I'm not there every day. Uh, um, we want to be able to collaborate with the district level superintendents to um, say here are some options, right? Here are some options across the state that can build your professional learning um, around particular areas, literacy for example, and give them the option to do that work well rather than kind of saying you better choose from these five. Right? And so what we have seen in high gain schools in Memphis and in Boston um, is that there are uh, menus of options and levels of support, um, but that 
you have the autonomy to do that work, but understand here are the expectations and here is the accountability, here's what the accountability piece is going to look like. And we're going to be in constant dialogue as we go. It isn't an I gotcha. Our goal is to create high performing schools. And so there, um, what we've done is we've designed that space and time and that infrastructure through this flexibility waiver to allow for that, which it didn't before. Coming into the reform office, you just had to check off boxes and get things done, right? And so now we're in a space where we can say, here are the options, here's where your school is, let's dialogue about this. Um, here are the expectations, go and do that work um, for those districts that are in that space. Not every district is. There are going to be districts who need a much more structured approach because they've been in a place for far too long um, in terms of achievement. Um, I, Michelle, please. Yeah, I think um, I just want to be clear about what you're saying. I, I, I think it's, um, it's what I'm hoping. I'm, I'm, it sounds really great. So instead of necessarily coming in and firing the principal and half the teachers and, you know, like if you're on this list for three years, you have to and have these incredibly disruptive things happen in the community. So you're saying instead of that, it would instead be <clears throat> um, uh, a, a slower pace, I mean, a pace that would like look more closely at the problem. So would that include an audit from MDE of what the problem, you know, I, my, my understanding is that the, or some ISD or some place to find out what the real issues are, is that part of this intervention plan as an audit? So I don't. I'm gonna. I don't want to use the word audit because that has um, a, di a slightly okay. different connotation to assessment, it around like, finance, like a, like and a, it, a, it scares like, people. Like an assessment of uh, I understand. identifying what the problems are. Sure. Not just saying, a diagnostic, right? Not just sort of saying, well, you need to, you know, kind of a cookie cutter. It's more um, tailored to that. Exactly. So um, diagnosing where districts are sooner, so they um, understand um, what's at stake. Um, from their, from our point of view, um, and our goal is to do that work collaboratively, right? So I want to be careful about the language we're using because it impacts the relationship that we have with districts. And we need a strong relationship with district level leadership in order for any of this stuff to work for kids. And so the idea is, yes, diagnose earlier where kids are, right? And not just on one metric, not just on a high stakes test. I need, we need to know how many kids are in a seat every day, how many kids are cutting class, where are kids going after high school, if anywhere at all, right? So those are all variables that play into college readiness. And so diagnosing kids or school districts earlier and doing that work collaboratively with districts, that's one piece. But to address your concern about, I believe you're referring to the turnaround plan. Right. Um, What's if, happening to that? If a school selects a turnaround plan, that's the plan that they're selecting, right? Um, so if they select a turnaround plan, under our current um, restrictions, you know, there are certain guidelines that you have to adhere to. Um, and that includes extended learning time. It may include the, you know, transitioning staff. I think what folks um, have a hard time digesting is that even if you transition staff out of one school, these staff members are by and large, for the most part, unionized. And so they pretty much go to another, find a home in another school and, and not find a home, but the district will work with them to find a home because you can't just cut teachers in most um, union-based school systems. And so that design, if the school selects a turnaround plan or if the district selects that turnaround plan, because there have been five, maybe seven, and in some cases, unfortunately, 10 years of not meeting progress or targets, um, that is uh, a plan that folks uh, select and it's much more aggressive. Um, and what research shows is that a transformational a transformation model actually hasn't had as much much impact or success academically. A much more aggressive um, turnaround model has worked um, in terms of longitudinal studies that folks have done so far. And so they don't have to select it, but they, so but, they sometimes do. But we're still operating under the four mod plans, yes. And that is based on something that we've chosen or something that the feds have said you have to have in this waiver? So. Right, so the four models exist across the country, right? So you can select a ref, uh, your reform redesign plan. There are four options. You can use transformation, which is much slower um, and less um, invasive, right? Um, research shows that achievement gains have not um, 
we have not closed achievement gaps quite as fast with a transformation model, but most schools um, or district level leaders select that model. But the there's the turnaround model, fat. and then there's I'm the, asking, yep. yeah, that's what I'm Based asking. On fat. Is part of the yes. waiver or part of something else? So the the four models come out of um, the school improvement grant language, um, but it is very much um, embedded in the ESCA flex waiver, not just for Michigan, but for um, all folks who are looking at the bottom 5% of schools um, in their state. But yes, it is a federal, um, it is. So even if we didn't have a waiver, we'd still have to force schools into these four models, which of reality, there's only two, because two of them they're not gonna choose, so. It's, but this language is also in our state law in Michigan. So this um, language is also in the um, school reform redesign uh, 1280C um, Which was going to be, I, I, maybe I need no, to please. hold off, but that no, was going to no, be my next question right, is what happens to our reform district if we're now doing all these other things and we're doing a three year instead of a one year, uh, you know, how does that affect what schools are being forced or, or maybe not in the future into the reform district? So right now our reform district, so right now we have not created a new reform district. Um, as you know, uh, we do have, we initially started out with the EAA, um, which the we have ended our exclusivity agreement. But um, what we have uh, done instead of designing another reform district, um, we are partners with EAA because we want the kids in that system to be successful, however folks feel about it being a reform district. It was created three years ago. There are still children in it, so whenever they have needs, we want to make sure we're a partner. That aside, if we park that thinking for a second, um, the idea here is not to replicate just another reform district or to have school districts do more. The idea is um, what do we need to do to make sure that we create high-performing school districts? And to do that work well, um, there, there are proven models that folks can select from, but it's not really about the models, it's how we implement and engage in them, right? And so if someone selects a transformation model or a turnaround model, it's our position to um, put, give them enough autonomy to identify what is it that school teachers or, and students need in order to do that work well. And so what we're proposing is not more work. It's not more of a checklist or more items. In fact, we've taken a lot of the language out under reform and redesign work just because we want skillful district and school level leaders to have the autonomy to do what they think works and we want to be more of a partner um, rather than just um, the person with the gavel or the person with the hammer hitting a nail. Um, and so we are looking at how to best support district and school level leaders in a way that helps them become um, high-performing districts and that's very different work than I think that Michigan has seen so far it's very different dialogue and very different um, way of communicating um, going forward can I quickly answer your question about the every three year naming with the priority list um, 12 ADC requires that we produce a list every year of the lowest 5% schools which so we're not doing next year right it's not going to do well that. Our, what, what we would like school. to do is provide them with the current list of priority schools those are the lowest 5% for this year and then we would update it in 2017. But in the interim years, the list stays the same. That's who we're programming with. That's who's under the SRO's jurisdiction. So we're we just meet, not adding to it. Pardon? So we, we meet the letter by doing that, right. even though we haven't updated it. So we hope, so we, we we hope to find support button. for that. Yeah. So the people who are, so the schools that are on the, in the uh, considered the lowest 5%, there's, there's a pause button on any action as far as, you know, these models of, firing the teachers and firing the principal and all that kind of stuff so that that would not happen to them during that time I think that um, what's important to know is that the firing of teachers and so forth that's a district level decision um, MD doesn't play a role in a low in a decision um, of that magnitude that is a local based decision and so under certain models um, a superintendent can choose to transition staff to other schools um, and or um, add new staff. Um, but that's not a decision that we make in our office, in the reform in the reform office for priority schools. It's a and part of the model, if, but it's a decision. I'm wondering if with the pause button, if... The three if, years versus the, two years. Yeah. Right, so with the pause button, those schools have already made decisions about which plan. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yep. With the pause yes. button, and then there'll be new schools down the road 
that would make decisions on a local basis about that. But in yeah. the meantime, they've so, made a decision about those plans. Isn't there a, a role for the MDE or in this in coming up with an agreement about, you know, like you've been in this situation for a long time, you have to now pick one of these things or it would be imposed on you? I mean, I'm, I'm like, it, I don't think, it, it, you're saying it's totally up to the superintendent of the district, but it, it's not been my understanding. So I'm, I'm just wondering why... So it's what? like it, the MDA has no say or... I'm not, I'm not saying that we're, we have no say. What I'm saying is that we're attempting to set up a very different type of relationship to help us as a state transition from just priority status or getting off the list to becoming high-performing schools and districts. That's a very different process that um, high-gain uh, states um, are engaging in. And so um, what we are looking to do is, again, rather than just saying, I need you to create this plan, upload the plan, make check this box, what I'm saying is we need to have a stakeholder dialogue meeting about what's been going on for the last five to ten years, and we need to have those incrementally. We need to identify what the expectations are, not just around high-stakes te testing, but also around post-graduation, um, you know, requirements and so forth. And I'm, through I'm, that... Go ahead. I'm just trying to understand the MDE's role because my question is, will there be a pause from the MDE on that role during this time when there's, um, you know, when they're not going to, there's not going to be this re, uh, reorganizing of the rank. So, um, so, so I'm hearing that the MDE doesn't have any role or the reform office. It's all up to this, this, the local districts whether to do these models. Um, but. My understanding is that there is a role for the department and the reform office in, you know, making pushing that decision onto a district. And so my question is, will there be a pause from the department and the reform office? And the question is no. The question is that there will be no pause from the reform office, but that the relationship will look different than it has in the past. Um, and so what that means is that I'm going, not just me, but our office is going to be working closer with district level leadership teams to identify what their needs are earlier so that we can help support that direction given our expertise. And so this is, again, very different work and looks very differently than what we've been used to. What we've been used to is you know, you haven't performed, you were supposed to do it this way, um, that didn't work, and now I need to make a recommendation to uh, Mr. Flanagan about what he needs to do with your school. But what we know across the country is that hasn't been the protocol for high-gain states. Um, and so, no, we are not taking a pause, but what we are doing is ga engaging in a relationship with the district level um, leadership team that is much more collaborative and much more transparent than it has been from our office in the past. John, to, to Michelle, you are going to continue in this new, better fashion with the existing schools. You don't get a new bunch of schools given the pause, right? Okay. Um, to I mean, Cassandra's question is really, um, we now have in state legislation um, categories of turnaround that are that if you're in the bottom tier, you you have to decide, and MD has to work with you to decide, which were mirroring what was basically part of NCLB. We'd have these four categories. Now, hypothetically, under our flex waiver, could we say we don't want to? We still have to figure out what to do with these schools that aren't performing, but. Could we theoretically say, um, we want to have an effective turnaround strategy with these schools that you are now going to work out and not necessarily have categories of them? Uh, if, if, if so, we'd have to, I think, still change the state law to have not requirements of these specific categories. Is that correct? Um, I believe the short answer is yes. The process that you're um, speaking to is again, a long-term strategy for state turnaround for priority schools. Um, what we don't want to do in FLEX is we don't want to identify a bunch of new protocols, to your point, Michelle, um, given that schools and districts are already bombarded with all kinds of regulations. What we want to do is do what's called, we want to do fewer things well rather than a whole bunch of things that don't work. Right? So that means sometimes, um, rather than introducing a lot more um, 
protocols, we want to be able to say, um, let's cut out what didn't work, all of the um, all of the restraints that we don't have any proof were effective, and let's figure out how to collaborate to move forward in a way um, that gets us closer to becoming high-performing schools. But to get at what you're referring to, John, yes, state law would have to change and allow for um, our policy to be aligned with practices that have proven to be effective in places that have demographics similar to ours. I'm just wondering... Kathleen, um, please, then oh, Michelle. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. John Kathleen. asked the question that I was... I want to ask about the need to change legislation. If we want to be more flexible, we're still stuck with those four plans, those four alternatives for turning around schools from both said from both uh, NCLB, which we're getting waiver from, but but from our own state legislature. So, so that's one thing that has to be changed. But I, I. It seems to me that this, this different approach, we've been focusing on this individual school, is, is that correct? So now we're going to focus on the district, district leadership, rather than just the school leadership. And that's a diff, that is a different approach. I think, that, I think that's probably a, a good thing to do because the district has to, well, there, there are more than one school, and many of these districts have a lot of schools to be fixed. So that's, that's, that's a good thing for them to focus on all of them, it seems to me. But without, so if I understand this correctly, mm. we're not going to have a top to bottom list anymore. So they won't be a bottom five. They won't be a bottom five percent anymore. Let me. Oh. Yeah. Oh, no, please go. Ahead. Let me clarify. Um, we won't. We don't want to use the top to bottom list in the the interim years, the non naming years. We uh, our our hope is to produce it, but provide it to schools is more of a warning. Something we've heard in the last couple of years is we don't even know what's coming, and then all of a sudden the list comes out. So this would give us a chance to show them, but it wouldn't be public. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about getting rid of the top to bottom list, and we had a lot of discussion internally. Um, when you're asked to find the lowest, you need a way to figure out. The lowest. So you either do a rank or you set up some sort of category system where you make sure the lowest only has 5%. Either way, you're forcing a rank. So in that, we'd like to still use it, but only in the naming years to, to do this. And we have some tweaks we want to propose that I won't get into today that help it be a little more uh, robust, I think. But So that's the plan. In naming years, we would produce it and, and share it. In non-naming years, it would be um, more of a risk, um, risk notification to schools and districts to plan ahead. And, and hopefully get out of the problem, right, before the problem comes. Right. Mm -hmm. And in that spirit, we'd still be fulfilling the law because there is a current top-to-bottom list. But can I just, can we, because I know some board members yeah. have to yeah, leave uh, earlier to today, <coughs> can we focus for and be sure that we're getting feedback on the parts that have to be, that are going to go out, mm -hmm. that are, you know, we've kind of done that, but I want to bring us back to the what we need to do today versus what we may talk about in agenda planning for further follow-up on some of these other items. So that because I think you, I'm sorry I had to I got called out for a bit, but I think we went through the timing and late March. Did you get through the plan on? Yes. Okay. So sorry if I'm repeating this. So what what might you need from the board? What might we need from the board to proceed? And are are we comfortable we we're getting to that? Yes. Um, let's go on the flex you. waiver. Yeah, I mean, yes. not on, on all the, the other, waiver. which yep. we can do at <laughs> another we time. We haven't even finished the presentation. Oh, okay. Yet. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> let so, me let that proceed because I, again, I'm worried about the constraints of time. We yeah. some key people have to leave early uh, as board members, so I'm going to. Okay. Thank push. you. Um, principle three. Let's talk quickly about principle three. This is where we talk about teacher and principal evaluations and support systems. Uh, that use multiple measures of performance, including growth as a significant factor. So to Cassandra's question, the federal requirement is that student growth be included in evaluations as a significant factor. There's also um, a piece of this where they want to see that you're including your state assessment data uh, in as a factor, although again, I think in transition time, there's an open discussion about when do you include state assessment data. And that previews bullet one, something we would like to advocate with the feds for on behalf of Michigan teachers, <laughs> is that we would like to delay that required use of state assessment data until the results from the 2016-17 assessment because that's when we'll have that two years of data from a stable assessment. We'd like to talk with them about, at, at a minimum, 2017. We would actually even talk about, can we 
you have to ask about, again, going back to the what's the intent of the assessment. If the intent of the assessment is to hold teachers accountable, you have to make sure that the system can do that, the assessment can do that, and that we're ready to do that before we use it that way. Uh, with our transition, we would think 2016-17 is the first time we would feel comfortable at some level with that. In the interim, we'd love to focus on, or we'd like to, uh, I shouldn't say we'd love to, we want to focus on those student learning objectives, which are when teachers <coughs> in a team approach set learning goals, set measures, and uh, reassess against that using local data. So it's not just set a goal, any old goal, and gather your own data. It's more constructive than that, but it's also a lot closer to instruction. And we think that that's important to drive practice, right? Focus on that data that's meaningful in a daily fashion while we bring online some of the um, that standard assessment data that crosses districts and schools. And then really focus on the relationship between the educator evaluations and the so what, the professional learning. The whole point, again, of evaluations is to improve practice for teachers and for administrators. And so if we're going to improve practice, there needs to be embedded development to support the outcomes of those evaluations. Um, so we know that there are questions and have been questions about, okay, so <coughs> we're pursuing the renewal. What happens though if we are not granted the renewal for any particular reason? Um, and, and the conversation has ramped up since last spring, of course, when, when a state in Washington State did have their waiver uh, revoked by US Ed. Um, and because of that, U.S. had conveniently developed um, some nice guidance documents around that. So we can paint a fairly accurate picture of what would happen <coughs> in absence of a renewal and the reversion back to um, the requirements of no child left behind. So starting in 2015-16, uh, so the next school year, um, we would have to revert to identification of schools as identified for improvement, corrective action, or restructuring. Um, and if you recall, that identification kicks in after the second consecutive year of not making AYP. Um, so a school that has not made AYP for the first two years in a row is identified for the first year of improvement and so forth. Um, we would be calculating that adequate yearly prog progress um, and making those identifications based on the requirement, as you know, that by 2014, 100% of students need to be proficient. Um, we would not, however, be starting from scratch in AYP identifications. It would be like we took a hiatus and we'd go back and carry forward the identification status from 2011-12. Um, so a school who had been identified one year in a row and was identified a second year would automatically be identified for improvement and so forth. Again, kind of that cascading effect of years not making AYP. Um, Districts with schools identified for improvement, corrective action, or restructuring, again, as you will recall, um, had to set aside uh, a fairly significant chunk of, of money, 20% uh, um, in year two, to provide the supplemental education services and transportation for public school choice. Um, they will have less flexibility in the transfer and use of certain title program funds. Um, so under the flexibility waivers, districts have the option for uh, various other title programs apart from Title I Part A, so Title II, Title III, et cetera, to transfer unused funds to those specifically targeted earmarked pots of money to Title I Part A, which is a more flexible pot of money, and they can use it according to those rules then. Uh, no Child Left Behind caps the amount that they can transfer at 30 to 50 percent, kind of depending upon the particular title program. And finally, um, we will be, we would have to go back to awarding new school improvement grants, new SIG grants, uh, based on the uh, tiered system, the tiered identifications, um, which under FLEX, we are able to um, target those SIG grants specifically to priority schools. So we know that we are hitting the bottom 5% performing schools in the state. Um, the tiers have a, complica a complicated set of rules um, such that what ends up happening is we are actually kind of foregoing some schools with greater need for schools that meet other tier, tiered um, criteria, and thus we could have, for example, you know, a school that is performing in the middle of the pack in the state that would be eligible before a school that is truly in the bottom 5%. Oops, <laughs> That's right. And the last point um, is that under FLEX, um, any school that's identified as priority or focus can choose to go from a targeted assistance to a school-wide title program. Um, under No Child Left Behind, that's allowable only if you have 40% or greater poverty. Of course, the benefit of going to a, a, to a school-wide program is that you have um, the ability to spend Title I funds more flexibly and for the benefit of the entire school's program, rather than identifying specific students that is in a much more complicated way to identify and track the spending and how you're, how you're using it. 
Okay. Now we can start discussion. <laughs> John, now this was healthy. I'm just trying yeah. to pack it what we do next meeting. The, there, there is a lot here, and uh, we very much appreciate everybody in the staff's um, work and engagement on it. And, and no one here is trying to um, uh, be difficult. We're just trying to push on some of these important issues. So really appreciate that. And just by way of context, I mean, Cassandra, in encouraging this kind of discussion, um, was um, also um, asking the question, uh, say 10 states, including Michigan, just said, hey, we're not, um, we're not turning in a flex waiver and we're not going back to the NCLB rules. Would they really hold up our money um, and punish states that way? Um, to me, even if they didn't, we would still, as a state, have to figure out what do we do to advance certain goals that we care about with Title I money and everything we have. And I would just remind everybody, some of us, Kathleen and Eileen, were here when NCLB came in. And, you know, the, the goals of NCLB are laudable, um, including all kids can learn and setting high standards for all kids and saying exposing achievement gaps so that the poor kids or the special education kids or that the kids of color were, were getting attention, insist that something be done about it, including turning around failing schools. NCLB never came with all the resources that were going to be promised and helpful to help in all that, and it had a bunch of blunt instruments that were unworkable. And so the question for us, I think, and for all of us is, how do we achieve similar goals that we want to achieve with much more flexibility, almost total flexibility if we want it, under whatever our plan is? And so is this plan being proposed, and how do we make it even more so? Um, does it help kids reach for high standards and high expectations? Does it close achievement gaps, which we care about? Does it have an effective way to turn around a set of schools that are chronically underperforming versus uh, a punitive or ineffective way? And those are the kinds of questions we should be grappling with as we look at these strategies and these proposals, because um, I really think it's still not easy to do all these things. Um, but if these are good movements to support the kinds of changes that we want to see happen, then that's, that's our job to figure that out. So how about the, the first really key question? Don't do it, 10 states, implications. And I wasn't even asking the question. I was trying to say, for us, that should not be the question, because we're going to have to do something to advance similar okay. goals, even if they don't punish it. Well, can, here's the question. There's a lot of great things in here. Do we really need a waiver to do them? So, for example, the literacy piece. Mm -hmm. Do we really need a waiver to do a third grade literacy thing? So that's a, uh, thank you for that question. That's a great question. Um, we don't need a waiver. What we, when we approached this as a, as a department, and actually uh, Susan and Kyle's teams were involved too, we said, we as a department need to be more coherent. And so when we did flex the first time, it was more piecemeal, kind of the few offices that were involved kind of got together, and it wasn't aligned with the priorities of the board and the, and the department in, in the way that it could be. So early literacy is a priority. We want to, to use a, a John term, sorry, we want to bake it into flex so that we are doing it all together, that we're in, what we're incentivizing in terms of accountability aligns with the, the point about early literacy. So we don't need a waiver to do it, you're right. So we're trying to find that balance of use the waiver as a vehicle and put in some things that we don't actually need waiver authority for. Um, the, I think the big question with the, with the waiver or with the not doing it is what would happen, what we see in other states that ha don't have one, is they basically end up with parallel systems. So they run AYP, everybody fails, everybody sets aside 20% for things that we know aren't terribly effective, and then they run some other system that supports their key goals. <coughs> we would like to suggest that's not as, as profitable for us. If we can find a way to make the waiver work for us, that's probably more advisable than the parallel system, but um, I think the points about what the waiver forces us to do are really excellent and, and something we want to watch for. I have a lot of yeah. questions. So, <laughs> but what, what would schools and districts say? I mean, when we say we, who are we referring to? We would prefer right. this. But if I was a local school, would it make more sense for me just to say, you know what, I'm just going to put this 20% aside, and then I'm going to do the things I really need to do to right. improve my school? We know that in, that's a good question. I think we should ask that in stakeholder feedback. That should be a piece that we ask. We do know in the last four years of implementation, the Title I set-asides have been a major pain point for people. Say that again. The Title I set-asides have been a major pain point oh. for people, the ones that we do for priority and focus schools. So something we've heard is when you take 20% and you say you have to use it for X, but they had hired a, um, a teacher who was teaching in this school for these kids, but now that school's not priority, and they're having to make real changes that have been uh, troublesome to them in terms of programming with their neediest <coughs> kids. 
I think if every district in the state that receives Title I all of a sudden had a 20% set aside that they now couldn't touch aside from supplemental education services and transportation, I think that would hurt. Districts are really using. And I think our feedback from them will verify that, but we'll report that we, back. Yeah. I think I that. I would appreciate asking the question on them. And sure. these are, this is helping us crisp up those questions, so thank you. I do think our past experience with this is that's a key point. I'd be shocked if they're not worried about having to do the set aside again. Can we go back and forth a little as you're building mm -hmm. up here? Yeah, I think with mm -hmm. Kathleen and Michelle, then. <laughs> I don't want to dominate the whole conversation. <laughs> 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 Kathleen, <laughs> Michelle, and. Asking all the I'm ask. Cassandra. <laughs> Kathleen, please. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm next. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of, the, one of the things I'm looking for here, but one of the things you talked about, I don't know if you need a waiver for this either, that looking at the whether we should keep our, our color coding business or whether we should do something else. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, the, the idea of, of changing to a letter grade is a high priority in the legislature. And uh, we, whatever we're doing, whether it's got to do with the flex or not, are we going to be doing something very quickly that we can recommend to the, make a recommendation maybe away from our color coding, which seems to have gone over like a lead balloon, I guess. <laughs> but I, yeah, uh, I, I think it, what's it happened. Like, it sounded like a good idea at the time, but it, it hasn't been interpreted. Well, and this was through stakeholder feedback, and then stakeholder feedback trashed the branding of the lime, the lime, and all the rest. Which I remember having a pretty direct conversation with ISD superintendents after their happy hour one day. So it was probably a time I shouldn't have brought it up, but it was kind of like you guys helped invent this. Now you're out with all these quotes in the paper, and you're probably now going to get A through F. So I think a fair response, but we'd have to determine this through, through the feedback that comes, is they don't like any of them, and, but they'd prefer colors, as bad as it is, probably over, over letters. But that's what you hear through their testimony uh, during lame duck. Um, but there is a certain, I think you're getting on the table, a certain reality of what seems to be happening across the street and where that's going. And I think a little bit of it is certain folks shot themselves in the foot. You know, right off the bat, they kind of, as you're inferring, said we're not really happy with the colors. Um, I don't. Can you help for a moment, even me, on this? The the implication for the fled, the, the fled, the Fed. Well, I guess I'm conflating Fed Flex is, is <laughs> FedEx or whatever. I, what's the implication for that? You, I know you covered it up here, but you could remind us of for the scorecard. Yeah. Uh, what FLEX requires us to have is a way to talk about progress toward proficiency for all schools, measure targets. So scorecard's the way we do that. <coughs> Whatever you label it is totally up to you from the Fed. Oh. Again, though, even escalate back to the point we started with, we would like to try to come out of this with one system. So we would like to be able to approach the legislature, to your point, Kathleen, and say, ADAP's important. What else is important? Bring the stakeholders to the table and see if we can get to a place where we don't have systems all over the place. So we're running A to F for the state, we're running something for the feds, we're running some other thing for somebody else. Schools already are suffering from way too much information. Um, we'd also like to produce the colors or the A to F or whatever only in those naming years publicly. So in the interim years, it would be that parent dashboard information. That's our kind of starting proposal to everyone to say, can we get any agreement around this and maybe find a place where maybe everybody doesn't get all they want, but maybe we can all get something we can uh, um, work together on. So again, FLEX requires us to have a way to talk about achievement of targets. Okay. Now I have, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with, with FLEX, but one of the things that, that bugs me is that we're talking about turning around the school so that the kids succeed. It's not turning around the school so the school is succeeding if the kids succeed. And one of the ways we, we don't talk about that I think is really critical is services in addition to school changing, I mean, the health services, social services, uh, the, the families need. We, we, there was so, so, when we looked at the, this other report on, the, on our progress on our, on our goals, it's, it's, very, it's very depressing to see some of the low scores, low percentages of kids that are successful. And it seems to me that somehow we have to start talking out loud about the need for wraparound services as, as part of this. And I don't know if it <coughs> doesn't have to be part of the flex, but where, how do we get that into the mix? That uh, the schools have to do it 
a, a, a different kind of a job mm -hmm. right. that's more successful. Whatever we, they've done, it hasn't worked, so we've got to try something else. But the schools, I don't think the schools should be expected to do it all by themselves mm -hmm. because the, the situations that many of these children are, are in mm -hmm. when they get to school, if they get to school, is horrendous in some cases. <coughs> and we, we have to do more to support them in their family situations. Uh, One thing that the priority schools have, have brought us is um, through Kyle's shop, there are, and, and then uh, coordinated with Natasha's shop, there's a, a, some grant opportunities that can centralize around priority schools, like safe and supportive schools, and then the, the new one, its name's Half slipping right. me right now, but that centralizes wraparound services in priority schools. So the, there's some federal recognition of we need to tie these things together and support outside the academics. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is a piece that Flex brings us, is who are the lowest, and then can we make sure to get them services that come outside of just the academic realm. I mean, part of this, in the spirit that John said, that certainly the goals behind this, even way back in 01, were worthy. But I think you're saying what you've said for a long time appropriately is that what do we do with these other opportunities for kids? And I, I would say, I would give credit that the pathways issue that we work together with DHS on, where folks have been moved, not as replacement to social workers, they're not social workers, but they are services that are more easily gotten by, you know, by by taxpayers and consumers in the, in the area when they can go right to the school. Um, I'm, for me, it's hard. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in watching how you take two giant departments here. Yeah, and, it's going to make it but the spirit behind it, I'm absolutely convinced, is the same as what you're describing. Mm -hmm. The spirit is trying to get to what you're describing. How do we get this so that people don't have to go to 14 different places for their to meet their needs? And you can do this in a how that happens is going to take someone a lot smarter than me to try to figure out how you do that when you combine DHS and DCH. But that's the genuine spirit behind it is exactly what you've said for decades, Kat. Well, you know, even just putting health services in the schools, yeah. I've been in schools where they have them and the scores have gone up. Right. It, it happens at every, every, every one of those schools I go to that had a health services, whether it was a clinic that, that would serve the public as well as the students, yeah. It made a that made a big difference because where parents who were formerly were reluctant were hesitant to, to go to the schools because their experiences had not been very positive probably right. or they don't speak the language very well or whatever when they go to the clinic and they sort of work their way into the right. school yeah. and the principal welcomes them with a with a re resource room or a lounge or whatever you want to call it. They get more comfortable. They start talking to the teachers, and the kids get the kids do better. Right. I mean, the, the I mean, there's some things we know that that work, and yet we we cut dreaming up all these other things to make it work. When well, we it's it's chewing gum and walking <laughs> at the same time because I do think the goal of what you're been trying to strive for for a long time is what can happen now with bringing these services to the school buildings, and that's the intent yeah. behind combining the departments. And then at the same time is identifying which schools those are. That's kind of John's point about the spirit behind trying to reduce the gap to not hide the kids that have struggled the most because, I mean, I've told this story before, but um, I was subject to some criticism over 20 years ago because we started to identify in a high-performing district when you took averages what really was also a problem which we weren't doing very well with some of our poor kids in particular, but it got with no malice, it just got buried in a high-performing district. So we started to drill down on our own, and then once you understand where the issue is, you can do something about it. But I, I think your points have been well stated over the years, and I think we're heading closer to that. Pathways has had good results in terms of graduation rates and third-grade reading. So, I mean, this is just build on that. I think that's what's given, uh, to say it, I mean, I think it is what's given the governor some confidence to try to pull these together in a way that isn't going to be this uh, hard to access for, <coughs> you just said it very well, in terms of maybe the best example with people who don't even speak English and are at the point where the fear of government perhaps and how you get, if it's right there at the local level. So we're close. I mean, this is something I would encourage the board over the next few months. This is really going to take place more uh, clearly in the next few months. 
Michelle, then Richard, then Cassandra. Um, I wanted to um, <clears throat> go back over some of the discussion around focusing, um, talking to stakeholders, giving them more power to superintendents, looking at a district as a whole. Um, before I do, though, I wanted to also, um, what I think John was talking about, um, looking at the waiver um, and looking to see if there are other options that could be considered besides the floor, <coughs> which I do not see as effective, and I'm not seeing any research that shows closing schools and laying off teachers and that isn't effective. I mean, I live in Detroit, and I see schools close all the time, and it devastates communities. It doesn't, and more, oftentimes teachers leave the profession when that happens, or retire if they can. They don't, <clears throat> it's very difficult, um, and painful, and hurtful to the kids. Um, so if we could find some um, other options, like the one you were talking about, where you have more dialogue, you have hopefully a better look at what the needs are, and addressing those needs, I mean, is there, a, you know, is it a po is it possible for us to add that into the waiver? And I've heard people say that there is more than the four options that are that are um, available in the federal law. And I and there's a fifth one, and I, it's escaping me. And maybe you know what I'm talking about. Sure, I think you're probably referring to under the SIG guidelines. Um, there has been an opportunity for there to be a fifth model that states can identify and move toward. Um, I do want to just address what you were saying uh, quickly, um, is that what a lot of your questions are much broader than this waiver, um, which means that when we are seeing high gain states, when we are seeing states that are rapidly closing achievement gaps, they aren't putting all of their eggs into one basket, right? What they're doing is they are aligning their state laws with practices that are proven and evidence-based, and there are essentially stakeholders invested that are not identified randomly, right? We know that MDE and the State Board are just two key influential stakeholders in education in the state. What we're seeing in high-gain states are um, alignments across what the governor's proposing, the, legislat the legislature, the state boards, the state departments of education, and also what we call in the field, the field. So all of your schools and your districts and your uh, universities, um, all of this work is aligning across the board so that when you talk about the purpose of education um, and whether or not to close schools or to provide professional learning, um, what each one of those influential factors um, is proposing is all aligned in, in the same. They don't, they aren't functioning in silos in a way that make this work um, increasingly difficult. So it's, it's hard to talk about turnaround um, in a flex waiver that's so short term, right? So a lot of what you guys are talking about in terms of um, turning around school, whole schools and whole districts and um, supports um, that go beyond classroom learning, that's a complex school-wide system that engages across five of those factions. Um, and, and in states that are making those types of gains, um, there is a lot of research out there that shows the infrastructure that allows for that to happen. And so we don't want to over-promise and under-deliver in this particular waiver, which is due in March, right? We okay. want to do the kind of the, fewer things back, well. I feel like it, yeah. um, and and I, you know, although I completely agree with Kathy about wraparound services, that's not yeah. what I'm getting at. Yeah. I'm, uh, what I'm looking at is what is that fifth option? That you, could you describe that fifth, fifth option? And, and does that fifth areas? option tie into and the flex we, waiver? And can, for today's can we discussion. make a recommendation that that be added to the, the, the flex waiver? We can look at what that could look like. Um, what I would, um, we can look at, we can talk offline about what that could look like and what those options are. Um, but again, successful models um, are built inside of a much, ro but, but much more I, robust Natasha, infrastructure. Natasha, if I may interrupt for a second, what I'm trying to get at is, is that is that relevant for the flex waiver itself? Not at the moment, no. That's what I'm trying to get at. So I, 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 that's why I'm trying to kind of separate what we may talk about at the next meeting, which we should handle in agenda planning, versus what we have to have feedback. That particular point isn't relevant to 
I don't mean that well, it is well, relevant. Well, I, th I think if, if we want, if the board wants to have a say, or at least uh, some considerations of what's in the waiver, I think we wait till next month. That's going to be so the third. No, week no, but that's why I'm asking: is it is it relevant to what we submit? If it's not, then we should wait well, till I, the next I meeting. I think it might be. Well, that's why I'm asking be. them to answer that. Right. So I'm I'm, but I I I'm still looking for just the description of what the fifth option is that I yeah. don't know. So to, I think to what Mike is saying. As far as we know right now, this is not something they're considering a flexibility. We're happy to follow up with you as said, ask about it, and we can get you more information. But right. right now, they have not offered it up as something that they're being flexible about. Right. Well, we said this was an opportunity, yep. right? And we opened this up. This is an opportunity to get stuff in Michigan, and maybe because they're willing to be more flexible, right. maybe this is an opportunity. So I right. want to see if this is an opportunity to look at those four options, which are Incredibly, and I think we're agreeing. Unpopular and unproven. I don't mean to cut you off. I think we're agreeing with you. Okay. So and but that is, we need to do some outreach to us at around this. Okay. Because so, if, if we wait till the next meeting, that's the third week in March, and then it's right. due on the thirty first. We, should, we, we right. shouldn't wait till the next meeting for anything that relates to flexibility. I get okay, that. Right. I'm just trying to narrow down because the time's getting away from us. What are the things that have to be decided? We need feedback from you today on for the flexibility. For instance, flexibility isn't just wide open. Whatever we want, it's within guidelines that we've been offered for flexibility. So I, I think we're hearing your point. If right, we have an so option. On yeah. the fifth. I'm not getting my question answered. What is the fifth option? And just a brief description of what that is under the SIG. The the fifth option, and again, I'll connect with um, the experts in this area. But to my knowledge, the fifth fifth option allows for a state to identify um, an opportunity that looks very different from what they're currently doing. So it could be anything that we think is we come up with, we come like, up with like yeah. an audit. Okay. I don't know if it's that flexible, but in a sense, in a um, to a certain extent, it give it provides the opportunity to do that work. There are some clear um, guidelines to it, though. So um, again, we can before March um, make sure that we share what those um, opportunities are. Why don't we agree on that? That if this turns out that that can be Michelle, to your point, if this turns out that can be part of the flex application, we hear you and we will mm -hmm. try to make sure that's attended to. And it can't be at the March meeting. It's going to have to be before that. We understand that. But I, my gut, from the way we've, we've spent a lot of time on this in our own in our own meetings, is that that isn't part of what we can do under flexibility. But that's what we're going to make sure beforehand. Even if it's not part of this waiver, that doesn't mean it isn't something that we should still work on and consider. I didn't mean to dismiss the point. I'm just trying to I'm trying to take advantage of the time to say what are the things we need board feedback on for the waiver itself. And uh, Richard and then Cassandra. And Eileen. Um, the, the principles, the three principles here are written in uh, a different print from uh, their explanations. Where does this language come from? That is directly from the ESCA flexibility renewal requirements. Okay, okay. Um, the second one I found particularly hard to comprehend. Uh, partly because you've got redundancy, continued commitment to continuous improvement and of systems, supporting systems. Um, it seems that could be tightened up a little, clarified. But that, oh. but if you're re if it's if it's a quote, then they Let's deserve what they get. For that one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Remember, these are federal it bureaucracies. Is, right. Richard, we're dealing. Well, with. Just, okay. <laughs> we would never do anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cassandra, then Eileen. The March 31st deadline, is that hard, and, or can we ask for an extension? We can't ask for an extension. We can ask, but I don't, they, Cause I, I don't I'm know what they would do, but they have not at if, any point granted extensions on any of these. If we're doing public comment mid-March mm -hmm. for two weeks. Nope, we feel your pain. <laughs> with the ability timeline. of actually doing anything yeah. with the public comment. <sighs> and that's, that's really the rationale behind doing so much stakeholder engagement up front mm -hmm. is that, like I said, that's kind of the, that's the final step. We've already had so many conversations up to that point that the draft that's put out for public comment reflects the input that we've received up to that point. Mm -hmm. And they released guidance in, was it December? November. November. So we are, we we would love another six months to work on this with everybody. Um, and we can certainly, again, in our advocacy with you, said, be like, do you got any flexibility here for us? But but they have not moved the timelines on us, and so we're, Abby's put together a great process that gets us as much as we can in a really truncated time, and the team here at the department needs a shout-out. They are working 
round the clock on this and really trying to get through a kind of a substantial redo in a number of these pieces. So for all the Flex team who should be listening, probably aren't, but if they are listening, um, just kudos to them for all their work. So I have two more quick questions. Um, is there anything in the waiver that allows the department to remove su local superintendents? Remove what? Local. Remove local superintendents? No. Okay. No. Um, <laughs> Would you like us to ask if there is? <laughs> that's a rumor, so you just you might want to be aware of that when you're making meeting oh, okay. with the stakeholders. Okay. Um, well, that's not the only rumor. <laughs> <laughs> Final, uh, this is really quite limited, actually, is what I'm trying to get across. Our opportunities under FLEX are actually quite limited. These other things are important discussions that we should try to do maybe within state law, right. you know, and change some of that. No, we don't want to do that in state law. <laughs> um, I mean, reduce the... Right. Purpose. But getting to that point, okay. next question. So you have on here a statewide initiative targeting third grade reading proficiency, which is great. I would love to have an actually, you know, data-based literacy program in the state but we also have uh, folks down the street who are looking at legislation that might be completely contradictory to what you guys are putting in your waiver mm -hmm. what happens then right so we've been working um, hard to stay aligned internally but also to do the best we can to stay aligned with the governor's office and, and the legislature to so that's not a thing fully in our control so to your point we want to put in the Put in the waiver things that are kind of universal principles to keep that tie between our work, but then continue to work on um, kind of a mutual approach to early literacy, which we've been we've been doing for the last few months. Does that mean that we're going to have anything close to mandatory retention in this waiver? Not oh, in not in the waiver. Well, certainly not. All right. No, and in fact, let's use that example. I mean, you know, I've spent time with some of the leaders on that just this last week. That I'm speaking for myself, and I know members of the board, and I think ultimately the entire board, that that's not the route to go. And that that's something we would be at odds on. But trying to help new leaders get, as some of you are going to have an opportunity later this week, John, I think, and Eileen, where they can see the benefits of the same goal, where kids need to be able to read, but not by this draconian uh, measure alone. Now, I would say, in fairness to Chairman Price, the new chair of education, who was kind of the bill uh, producer at that, but hearing her you can see she really gets tying these two together the supports and the interventions long before that um, so that's what yeah we have to watch this closely through the legislative committee and others but there's a point where um, number one I don't know that this even calls for it in the flexibility but we would we would never take what we haven't agreed on and then try to influence others to support that could we lose that we could lose that if you look at some of the forces behind third grade reading as the end game you can see they're fairly significant forces out there um, I would say I really appreciate when Lupe the last meeting uh, as you've done regularly by the way so but this just happens to be the most recent time when trying to as best we can understand the fights we pick if that's the right way to put it with those that are ultimately uh, in power in the house the senate and in the governor's office and John's been a proponent of that for years you know I was talking about how do we work together how do we get the sides if I had to say there's one piece of worry that I have in my last few months it's that can we nurture that enough so that we're not disregarded you know that we we do this in a way that I thought Lupe said last month John said in previous months that ultimately we can say all we want about this and in the final analysis if the law for instance in that example said third grade retention you're back we're done but I get your specific point. We're not putting any of that stuff in the flex. And the, and it, it, but we are putting things in that could be helpful to help third graders read, yes. which might be helpful to inform any third grade legislation right. yes. so that it isn't just punitive, but is adding the essential, let's do some things to help. Right. Yes, and, and I was very happy. I thought Chairman Price seemed to be in that mode. Um, so that was very helpful to hear the other day. And we can continue to nurture that. This is what really I think Vanessa is talking about. It's this nurturing back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, I think Eileen was next. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm sorry. Uh, I just I wanted to say that uh, uh, the, the, <coughs> the bruise in, uh, in the legislative eye by reason of standards and in, in, in assessment disagreements, and I consider it to be highly desirable that we stay focused on uh, shared issues with the legislature and the governor. 
so that we can keep on working to develop solutions for better education in a local control state, which really makes this an interesting challenge. Um, unlike Massachusetts, we don't have the capacity right now, uh, perhaps later, to have a really solid, broad conversation on how to coordinate focus funding that also uh, ensures the uh, higher student outcomes. And from this presentation, what I'm able to glean between blowing my nose and uh, listening and looking at PowerPoint, it appears that uh, the uh, department's work uh, is stellar, and it looks to be a good path uh, to work on toward achieving common state K-12 goals of the legislature and the governor. And I'd like to just say that if we do this well, uh, as uh, uh, one of the staff says, we don't want to overpromise. we want to make sure it's deliverable, we want to make sure that it works for schools. If we do this well, it could lead to a healthier conversation with the legislature and the governor on the adequacy of funding for K-12 in the future, which certainly from what we're trying to do in their adequacy study should be our goal. Thanks. Thanks, Eileen. Other comments or questions? I, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> I had a second part. Like a part about the superintendents and the meeting with the stakeholders. Yeah, I'm trying to get a better idea of what that is because it sounds like it could be like a, a really great uh, step. So when you say the stakeholders, will you be, be including like, um, you know, the um, also maybe the board members, union president of the local, if there's a teacher's union, um, uh, PTA parents. So when you bring, when you come, and I know you, you talk about empowering the superintendent, but also talking about stakeholders. Um, uh, my personal experience is I've seen some amazing superintendents and I've seen some really bad superintendents. And so, uh, I would hope it would be a broader mix and more voices at the table to assess and figure out, and, you know, get buy-in for everyone. So I'm, I'm wondering about that at the, when, you, when you're going at the district level. And um, so that's one question. Then the other question is, if they're found, would that mean that a district would be subject to one of these turnaround models, one of these, uh, like, punitive actions or is it just a school? Would, it, would this open it up to the subject, the whole district to be closed or to be, uh, is that part of the plan? So it's one about the stakeholders and two, what happens to the district if they're found to be continually failing? Yep. So again, just trying to parse this out, if I understand you correctly, the first question about stakeholders is that we want to initially start with um, obviously a dialogue with the superintendent. And that person is the leader of that those schools, right? And so he or she knows what the goals are or should. And so we want to start with that dialogue first. Um, that person is the um, reports to the board. Um, the principals report um, to the folks that are identified as their direct um, uh, that are appropriately identified. And so our first step is to first connect with the district level leadership, and that would be a superintendent. From there, we want to be very clear and specific about the expectations for what we would call a stakeholder meeting. And that's in collaboration with the superintendent. So I wouldn't go out of my way to, um, you know, bring together a group that I hadn't dialogued first with um, about, or I had I. I would bring together a group um, that was clearly identified in collaboration with a superintendent. And so in that second meeting, we would want that to be a much broader group in terms of who's there. And obviously, we would want parents there. We would want uh, board members to be present and so forth. Um, I'm sorry? Are representatives of the, of the teachers? Absolutely. Absolutely. These are all... Well, again, my goal is for me to be able to dialogue with the superintendent to um, be very clear, specific, and transparent about why it's necessary to have that representation, right? And so um, I think sometimes we do make the assumptions or we know specific cases where people don't want those guys there, and at the end of the day, it's just about a really candid conversation about why it's necessary uh, because they are a, a variable in um, this larger cogwheel of that's necessary to create high-performing districts. And just on that point for a minute, the relationship to the flex waiver is? So the, re <laughs> so the relationship with the flex waiver is all around us transitioning from just looking at schools to district-level turnaround right, but, support. But the flex waiver itself isn't going to inform that. 
it doesn't necessarily inform that at scale to the extent that I think that uh, we're referring to at this table. What it does provide for is the opportunity for us to say, um, Superintendent, we would like to sit with you to dialogue about where your schools are and how to um, have these stakeholder meetings and move forward given the expectations. Right, but that's part of this. Well, this is going to be included in the, in the flex. This is, you brought up the subjects, so I'm assuming this is relevant. Right, district level supports and turnarounds. But it, is it with that level of specificity? Which flex, part? The flex waiver requires that we identify priority schools, explain how we identify priority schools, and then explain the supports and interventions around the priority schools. So, so to Michelle's point, would it be as specific as superintendent and other, other appropriate uh, parties and listing them? Is it so, that specific? So we we are in the process of putting that information in there, but currently what happens is that our monitors do actually already meet with um, schools and their leadership teams. Um, some of our monitors and coaches will have a good enough relationship for that superintendent to attend. What we're seeing in high gain states is that superintendents are much more involved in the turnaround process. And so we do want to create an opportunity for us to connect directly with superintendents. Um, and and, and that's would, just a slightly different shift. I would say this. I mean, our experience certainly with the deficit districts that we have to meet with is it's always, always much more beneficial when we've had union leaders here and the entire board. In fact, Pamela's been great in helping us facilitate something like that in Saginaw um, because, you know, we can't order that, but it never, it's always a better result. And then everyone's hearing the same thing, and you don't hear later that person X described these are the requirements. I mean, for instance, that one's particularly frustrating for us at times because assigned to us are, are declarations that aren't accurate. We don't even have the authority under the law at times. So this is why, as an example in this case, we're saying let's get all the party. With that spirit, I think what Natasha is saying is ultimately the board in a local situation is going to hold the superintendent accountable. Having said that, we're going to do everything we can to say, why wouldn't you have the union leader here? What are you even thinking? Because sometimes the you know, board this members is, don't hear what the, what, the, what the teachers are hearing. Right. Sometimes it's influ overly influenced by the superintendent. That's, so that's it's true. it's better to have more voices, I, I think. I think we're in agreement on that. It's, a, it's, a, it's yeah. an issue of, uh, you know, encouraging local control to do it that way as opposed to kind of this old, old school way right. that doesn't get the results you need. And even the alignment of the five pieces that kind of Natasha talked about, which isn't you know, directly inherent in the flexibility waiver, but that's the one why I wanted to compliment Lupe the last meeting. I mean, there's a point where a little bit of the frustration, and I hope I'll see this clearer starting after July 1, is we can work as hard as we want and have the best of intentions, and then all of a sudden, without being able to align the actual powers with us <coughs> that can pull some of this off, you can have third grade example, third grade reading being a, an example of a total mismatch. Um, so the ideal world we would describe on all working together, and it doesn't happen in many states, so we wouldn't be an aberration of that, but it starts, you know, with the kind of lack of civility even at the national level, the highly partisan talk and dialogue that doesn't occur, and it's something I think we have to keep aspiring to. Otherwise, we'll sit here and kind of feel like, well, we were right, it's just that we didn't prevail. My second question? Yes, ma'am. The second question uh, that was asked by Michelle is what yeah, happens? Um, right? District, so absolutely. what happens to a district in the event um, that, I don't know, they don't meet their targets? And so there is, uh, there are a number of steps between um, what happens and us in that initial meeting. And ideally, during that initial, those initial stakeholder meetings, we have discussion and dialogue about um, expectations and milestones. And we don't, um, and we over time, we make sure that we do have incremental meetings where we discuss where kids are at certain milestones. And when st students are not meeting those targets, um, it is very clear and apparent that you may find yourself in a position where there is a recommendation made um, to the superintendent who um, at that point has to determine um, whether or not a school needs to um, go to a next level of accountability, so it right? Be on school level, it wouldn't be like the state saying this district is is a priority district. I mean, 
therefore we're going to close the district. So we're not we close all the schools in the district. Right. So this conversation um, is probably somewhat removed from closing a district. We're not talking about district closures. What we're talking about is what would need to happen over time to create high performing schools. And so with that said, we're starting with a stakeholder meeting. Um, we have periodic meetings with the superintendent present. Again, we have meetings now, but the superintendents don't always attend. Um, and so we want to have stakeholder meetings um, that are periodic and that I, and at which we discuss expectations and we identify what the milestones are. You either met targets or your kids didn't meet targets, right? And there are a variety of targets that we identify in that process. Throughout that time period, all along, we are extremely transparent about where kids are, when, who's been participating, who's not, what that dialogue has looked like. But at the end of the day, over a period of time, the superintendent has to receive a recommendation for what should happen next with that school and that district, given all of the information that we've collected over time. That does not currently happen um, under our current guidelines to, at that level. And so that's what we will be looking to do. Um, we would be able, we would be looking to identify where kids are sooner over a period of time, completely transparent across stakeholders. And at the end of the day, there are going to be districts that have improved because they fundamentally understand the, the um, expectations. And there are going to be districts that don't. Um, but it's not going to be a surprise. And the superintendent, at the end of the day, the state superintendent, will receive a recommendation um, for what should happen next. And again, that dialogue is continuous. Um, and for some states, that's receivership or um, an EAA-like function. Um, but uh, but we're not, not talking not, about not district closure. But not a recommendation to close a district. No. Right. Question. No. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. Pamela. I, I don't want to belabor this conversation, but you asked for conversations or topics that we could discuss at a later time, and yes. I think that I would love to um, give further discussion to this about deliberative processing in communities and how can MDE play a role in that um, as it relates to this local leadership group that you plan to meet with. Obviously, every community and district is, is different. Um, so, um. Let's do that. And we'll put that on as possible topic, agenda planning. Um, can I suggest that this is the real meat of what our work is, so this is all healthy, and we probably should do two things. One might be, given the time and, and the fact that some folks are going to have to leave, do, do we want to do one of two things, either postpone the item on the priorities till the next meeting or, or, or give this to you in more detail in writing? That would be your choice. And we could decide that if you want an agenda planning. And then in agenda planning, tentatively hold a space for continuation of this dialogue that's beyond the flex. You know, it's the bigger picture, important stuff we're talking about. We can figure out how to label that and how to get the proper points, including the one that Pamela just brought up. And any, any, I think if you could send us something in writing and that way we could come with, with our thoughts as well, that would be helpful for me. Yeah. The PowerPoint gives a lot of information about it. Oh, that's true. The PowerPoint yeah. that we got gives a lot of information on progress, and it's scary, sort of. So, uh, <laughs> on wh which one now? I'm, I'm the PowerPoint uh, for items. Priorities. Okay. Scary in what sense, so we can get ready? Well, <laughs> <laughs> what I referred to before, the we, we want to bring up the, the performance level of the lowest performing students, and we're focusing on African American males particularly. That was one of the fo focus focal points that we decided to do last year. And according to the, their, their percentages are so low of where, of where they're where they are that it's that there's something that something is not working well so that's what we would talk this whole business with the flex is this we started to get into that and uh, that's that's where i really was going to bring up the business of having this wraparound services and other things because it's much more than just what's going on in the school evidently i mean we couldn't agree more it's one reason we wanted to expose ourselves to the reality of this and then work on it. And by the way, we felt that this was because the data led us there, had the data led us to some other subgroup. But we feel like we're learning from that particular work how that impacts all kids that need to mm -hmm. be, be uh, yeah. thoughtfully attended to to reduce the gap. I mean, some of these, some of these percentages are, are 
the shocking. Are dreadful. I, I, yes. I, mean, it's, we could postpone I know people but, are working hard to change this, and yet it doesn't I, I, I think you'd be proud of It's not what, happening yet. So there's, there's something more that has to be done or something different that has to be done. Right. First thing is understanding the problem, which... So I think we need a dis more discussion of this, but for more ideas or something. Well, maybe we maybe we take because that was inherent in the priority discussion. Yes, that's so. I would ask you this: we we're we'd be happy to do whatever we want. We can continue that today. We can refocus that a little bit based on agenda planning and try to do a more pointed point about the priorities at the next meeting. What would your yeah, I will think be? we should postpone that discussion, but share the information and us come prepared to ask questions about it. Okay. Because it is distressing. It just have a big presentation. Yeah. Let's, let's have I, that. I, I would say this so you don't leave depressed. <laughs> it, it, I think we're going to show to you, especially with some of the work done by, I sit in on most of the brown bag lunches where we work on that very uh, process, and the people who are leading that in-house, we probably want to incorporate that somehow. We did that at leadership team, and I think it helped the whole team understand where we can go with this and how prior. Um, are we okay with the way John suggested that for next meeting? Mm -hmm. yeah. and we'll get yeah. that. Okay. And could I? I think I could do take five minutes to do item D and my report because I'm one. I apologize. I have to leave early to um, do some family uh, business. Um, so, if people are willing to take five minutes, mm -hmm. sure. okay. Thank you, guys. So, very good. Item D, the, the superintendent search, as uh, I'm mainly going to reiterate um, what I've said before about where we are. February 19th is the deadline, uh, and there is uh, information on how to apply at both Ray and Associates and our website. Um, as we've um, put together, we are eager to find someone who is. Uh, who's going to help us uh, improve education with the ability and experience to do that, who can work well with us and who can work well with other stakeholders, including the field and the legislature and the governor, uh, and who can help us in all of those uh, efforts and relationships. We've all been encouraging, and I am very encouraged, uh, top quality candidates uh, to apply from Michigan and beyond. Uh, I did check in with Tim Quinn. Uh, and who says that we are getting a significant number and a broad range of what, from observation, appear to be quality people from Michigan and outside to apply, which is encouraging. Uh, I think if we have a, uh, uh, a good family of applicants, I want to keep encouraging people to put their hat in the ring uh, with different experiences, different skill sets, uh, uh, different perspectives. Um, we're going to have the opportunity to uh, uh, look at them and, and understand more about them and have some uh, good uh, choices to be made. So um, I trust that that's going to be the case as we uh, and reach the end of the window and we will have a, a, a quality pool. I just would reiterate, I think we've said before as a board, that I have no favorites. I don't think this board or board members have any favorites in this hunt. Uh, we are open and eager to look hard at anyone, particularly those who apply in confidence, which they can. Uh, and only when one is at a point of some winnowing of the field will one need to decide if one is um, willing to go public at that appropriate time. So continue to encourage people to, uh, to participate, uh, encourage that we appear to have a significant number of quality people interested in pursuing the job and, and appreciate that, um, uh, give us great opportunity for picking the next superintendent. Any questions from yeah. Just a little better understanding of what March 3rd will look like and what is it, March 10th and 11th? We well, set some dates with the search agent, uh, agency that will be sort of next steps in terms of uh, the process from here. So we're holding those dates. Um, okay. In broad strokes, as we discussed um, at some of the collective meetings, uh, at some point, uh, probably the first coming together, uh, the search firm will be bringing forward all the candidates that will have applied, because we do these things in public, uh, with those in confidence, kept in confidence in terms of uh, their uh, representation by number. So they will make some recommendations, but we'll have the opportunity to look at all the applicants and see in public, and we can talk in private for those that want to be kept in confidence, uh, how we might um, 
narrow the field a bit, we're not sure how much, to some that we want to learn more about and be more interested in. And then there'll be more homework and research and outreach done around uh, a, a smaller pool. Uh, and, and then at that point, we'll have to, um, we'll be meeting again or in a series of meetings to winnow that pool and uh, have some of that begin to happen in public naming of who's participating. So it's, it's an iterative process, but that first one, so we're holding those dates to sort of enter that phase, assuming we have a pool of quality people that we feel we can begin to process. So it will all be public, but just names may be removed for those we, who we have requested We can go into it. private session to discuss in detail candidates who want to be kept in confidence okay. through the first kind of time we do that. Okay. And so hypothetically, let's say we have, you know, 50 applicants and you put them into, or 100, you put them into, we put them into buckets of, you know, not really qualified, maybe, and some top quality people. And we might discuss them in public and we might discuss in private the ones that whose names aren't revealed, then we might narrow the field to seven or eight or ten or five, you know, that we want to learn more about. And I think at that second stage, as that proceeds, when we would notify those, you're under consideration as one of the five or ten. Now, at this point, you need to decide, are you willing to have your name go public? Because we are doing more homework uh, and winnowing, and we, we might need to take several steps in that. And John, for those that are asking, you have tentative interview dates. Right. Do you yeah, not? so that we've sort of mapped through, and, and That's, uh, Maryland's uh, shared that with everybody. Yeah, so it's, but if, I mean, if even we hit these marks, right. and we have to be flexible because I mean, this is a important process. If we hit these marks, then we're ending up with some public interviews at X point in time. And those are tentatively. March third is the first one. No, I mean for the interviews. The tentative interviews were, I thought, the next tenth and eleventh. So I'm, I'm only saying for people that are. You know, you know them. I know a lot of folks are talking about this. They just didn't know them. And so the board has to be flexible depending on their work. But tentatively, they put down the 10th and 11th is what I've told them as possible okay. interview dates. And then possible final interviews on, I, I thought, the 18th or that, something. That information about our, our tentative schedule of some board meetings to work the process and then some potential interview dates is a public piece of information mm -hmm. that could be made publicly available mm -hmm. to all. They're not that. listed on okay. our agenda, the dates that we have so far. I will start adding them to the agenda, and I will also post them on the website so people can look it up. On our website. And I just thought, because I know, I know candidates have told yeah, me they're be, listening in more now, so they can <laughs> think about not only probably how they present themselves in the interview, but also be ready for transition if they're selected, which is smart. But that, that's why I thought it would be helpful that they're hearing that's the tentative thing 10th and 11th mm -hmm. that you were selected for an interview and then possibly the 18th if you're a finalist the 18th that is the date keep the day clear on your calendar 18 is the uh, 18 is the uh, interviewing date i'm sorry you said there's 10th and 11th are the first yes. okay and then the 18th the would be finalists. final interviews if you had oh. a couple of finalists uh, and i'm sorry if i mean uh, uh what about we're holding several other days including one that now is on the governor's education and economic summit that's the third. Um, uh, the third is that released now? No, we're holding some days for our group meetings to work right. the work the process. Right. I'm just asking whether that because that one in particular is in conflict with the governor's economic and education. Yeah, it is. I have a problem. Mm -hmm. On the 18th, I'm not going to be here. Is it possible to change that date? It's possible. Why? Why don't? Why doesn't everybody? share with Marilyn the potential conflicts good. that they're worried about on these dates and we'll see if we can renegotiate any of them to, uh, to, to satisfy most but not all um, if it's proven possible I mean and if there's a site visit that's made to that finalist final candidate mm -hmm. that would happen before the 18th or uh, I doubt if that will happen but okay it was part of their proposed notion of what okay and just, um, just for Maryland. So the dates, one more time, the dates that we're holding now are the 3rd, the 10th, and the 11th, and the 18th. And the 18th. And the 18th. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. And, I, and if I understood you, your comment, the last meeting is the contract calls for those dates. So you'd have to make sure you had Tim on board and others if you were to change dates. Because I'm sure they could be flexible. I just, it would mm. be a detail you wouldn't want to miss. You're all here, and he's not. Okay. okay. Um, uh, very quickly, I was just, during my report, I was going to 
we have a few formal committees that the president appoints, um, and I want to thank people for serving on those committees and uh, also remind everybody that all of our meetings and all of our committee meetings are always open to everybody's participation, um, though we have a few um, members who are, are formally um, uh, on these committees. And so, again, thanks to Cassandra, the Legislative Committee. Cassandra will chair uh, Lupe, Kathleen, and, and Eileen. Uh, the formal committee members, um, the school f trust fund for the blind trust fund, uh, Michelle and Kathleen have been uh, serving on and will continue to serve. And thank you for that. Um, the school health committee, um, Pam uh, also is is interested and willing. So along with Kathleen and Richard um, to serve on that committee, which is uh, again thank you and very welcome. And I just would note that Kathleen is participating on our behalf on NASB's Government Affairs Committee by telephone. That just and happened yesterday. yesterday. That's great. She's familiar with it, and I thought yeah. that was um, appreciated and, and helpful. Though there's some meeting in D.C. that she can't go to, so I don't know if anyone else can or if we can pay for it. They won't pay for it, but that's oh, one. That's and, and Richard, of course, is on the Central Governing Board for NASB and has that role. So thank you, Richard, for playing these, uh, these important roles. And I am sitting on the career readiness, which I That's think right. meets at the same time as that. Yeah, yeah, I think they're the other meeting at the so same time. So. It's, it's okay, great. Thanks, yeah, John. What would you suggest for returning from lunch? Pick a time. One, One o'clock. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, that's our typical time anyway. We'll go right to public participation at that time, and then we have a few interesting afternoon items. Kathleen, our meeting in March is the 17th. Are you going to?